morning, everybody. Good morning. We'd like to call to order the August 7th uh, meeting of the Board of Supervisors. We can begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Chair Friend? Here. And if you could all join us in a moment, a brief moment of silence on the Pledge of Allegiance. And Supervisor Coonerty, you wanted to address something briefly? Yes. I, during our moment of silence, I hope you'll keep in the thoughts, uh, keep in your thoughts, the Zockley family. Bob Zockley, a tremendous local businessman and just wonderful person, passed away in July. Uh, and we just want to uh, send our thoughts and prayers to the family. Thank you. If you'll join us. Welcome back, Mr. Palacios. Do we have any revisions or corrections to today's agenda? Uh, yes, we do. On the regular agenda, item number four, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo, uh, which is packet page 14. And then uh, item 10, uh, this was moved to item 3.1. And item 11 was moved to item 3.2. Uh, regarding the closed session, item 13, staff requests the deletion of sub-item B, conference with legal counsel, significant exposure to litigation. And then on the consent agenda, item 35, there's a revision, deleted attachment A, packet pages 616 through 623. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. We're going to begin uh, with the action on the consent agenda, or do we begin with the public comment? Just so I can make sure I'm public, clear on public, public comment. comment. Okay. Which includes both of them. All right, so this is, uh, we're doing things differently. The board has adopted a new policy for public comment. This will be an opportunity for members of the community to address us on any item that is not on today's agenda, but also any item on consent. If you are unable to stay for any of the items of the regular agenda, you can also make a comment during this time, but either way, you'll be allowed three minutes for any item that's not on today's agenda or any item that's on consent. I know the majority of you are here for uh, the affordable housing issue. There will be an opportunity to speak to that during that time, but if there's an item that is not on today's agenda, an item that's on consent, now is your opportunity to address us. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Robin Brune. I'm a member of the Valley Women's Club Environmental Committee, and I'd like to address the board on a matter that is not on the agenda. We are concerned about fire safety in our community, and we would like to speak about PG&E's A New Community Wildfire Safety Program. They're passing out brochures. I have a little packet to give the um, board a conclusion of my remarks. But according to their brochure of their wildfire safety program, PGE intends to cut a swath of trees and other vegetation in the zone of 15 feet on either side of any power line in high fire threat zones. Uh, most of Santa Cruz County is in a high fire threat zone according to the CPUC fire threat map, and that is for utility associated wildfires. That's what high threat zone, tier three zone is. We're in a uh, zone for utility associated wildfires. So we do not believe the answer is to cut 15 feet of trees on either side of all of our power lines. That will have a decimating impact on our view shed, Graham Hill Road, Highway 9, and in many of our beautiful rural neighborhoods. In addition to beauty, trees provide, uh, prevent erosion and landslides. They mitigate open wind quarters. Uh, they mitigate temperature, energy use, and climate change. Trees are efficient sound barriers. There's lots and lots of reasons we want to keep our trees. We do understand the importance of uh, mitigating fire risk, but we think that PG&E's program is very short-sighted and not really effective. And we would like to make the following requests of the Board of Supervisors. One, we'd like some pushback on the PG&E program. We would ask that you direct legal counsel to um, 
research the PG&E program, how it's gonna impact our local ordinances on riparian corridors, scenic byways, uh, uh, other aspects of our general plan. Um, it's all potentially gonna clash with those. Uh, we would also um, like that the Board of Supervisors work with PG, PG&E and ensure that they have meetings regionally uh, throughout the county before there's any implementation, implementation of this program to address a lot of questions. For example, why are they choosing this 15 feet? Uh, the, uh, by their own brochure, only four feet is required, but they're extending up to 15. Um, we have some research that we've done in the letter um, that we're submitting, but um, also where is it gonna, how's it gonna impact each individual homeowner, what recourse do they have um, to kind of share information and communicate. We think that's um, very necessary. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. That was three minutes. <laughs> yes. Good morning, welcome back. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Friend. Some of you know me, I'm Catherine Rockwood from Watsonville Hospital. Mr. Caput has met me personally in the nursery. I'm here to just celebrate um, Worldwide Breastfeeding Week, as, uh, and it goes on through the whole month. I wanted to share it with you that Watsonville Hospital became designated as a baby-friendly hospital. It took us seven years with the help of WIC. We would not have been able to do it, women and infant care. And, um, and all that means, people are probably saying, what's baby friendly? Aren't you people baby friendly? You take care of babies. It's 10 steps to ensure that parents get the information they need to be successful in feeding their babies. It goes from the CEO all the way down to the cleaning people. We all speak the same language. And I invite you to come out Friday and walk with us three to six in the Watsonville Plaza. Bring your wives, bring your kids, bring your babies, bring your dogs. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your work. I just want to thank you on behalf of my wife uh, when uh, we were at Watsonville Hospital in Dominican. Thank you very much. Well, and here's the plaque. All right. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nora Urena. I reside in Watsonville. This is my baby. This is baby number four, <laughs> all born here in this county. She's very cute, I wanted to come. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I came just to speak on the importance of the Baby Friendly Initiative, where, <laughs> um, <laughs> Before, when we have staff in the hospital who were not educated well enough in the importance of breastfeeding and giving babies their right to breastfeed, it became difficult for um, friends of mine who were <laughs> experiencing um, a NICU stay or a longer hospital stay after giving birth because there was a discrepancy in training. So we would have some nurses who were like Catherine and were like, okay, this is what you do to ensure successful breastfeeding. Stop that, baby. <laughs> uh, and then other nurses who hadn't been trained well enough. And so mothers were getting really frustrated with this baby friendly initiative. All the years that it took means that more babies like this one have a better chance <laughs> at having a, a strong, successful breastfeeding relationship with their mamas. <laughs> um, I'm a local doula, so I help support mothers during childbirth, but I'm also the new co-coordinator of the Nursing Mothers Council, which has been around for more than 60 years here um, in the Bay Area and in Santa Cruz County. And so we are a volunteer organization going through helping mothers succeed at their breastfeeding goals. So I wanna thank Catherine and <laughs> Dana and their incredible hard work. And thank you for giving our babies the opportunity to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. If you could, we could keep her for a while. <laughs> you know, like, um. She's like really <laughs> into people, so she could probably go around dancing. She's gorgeous. <laughs> thank you for bringing her in. Good morning, welcome. Thank you Good for morning. waiting. Oh, my pleasure. Good morning. Dana Wagner, Community Bridges WIC Program and Santa Cruz County Breastfeeding Coalition. And I have a little poem. 
Our Breastfeeding Coalition is here to be heard, to thank this board and to spread the word that Santa Cruz County ranked first in the state for our hospital's exclusive breastfeeding rates. All of our hospitals have been put to the test and have shown that their breastfeeding help is the best. Each hospital did extensive preparation to earn the prestigious baby friendly designation. And all of our members from Watsonville to the north worked tirelessly to provide mothers and babies support. WIC, Birth Network, PAMF, Salute and Alliance help moms to breastfeed with ease and confidence. So we thank you today for your recognition of our work and for signing our breastfeeding proclamation. So join us in celebrating all that we share at WIST's August 10th Breastfeeding Health Fair. All right, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add, uh, we just heard the word uh, this week, Community Bridges WIC program was awarded a USDA National Award of Excellence for its breastfeeding support. So, yeah, thank, you. so thank you for your support and please join us on the 10th. Thank All you. Right. you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, uh, Kevin Collins. Uh, I live in, at a Felton address. I'm also here to speak about the PG&E wildfire community welfare plan and uh, the way I approached it was to prepare a formal complaint to the Public Utilities Commission. I had to do this without legal assistance so I have no idea whether the Commission is going to put this on their docket or not but it is, uh, I discovered a great deal of information during the weeks of research I did on this topic. Those of you who don't live in the, in the mountains, in other words, live in, in ordinary subdivisions in heavily developed areas, you don't see this downed wire issue like I do. Many times, I've lived in place for uh, three decades, and I frequently see downed arcing wires flash arcing to earth at 12,000 volts. It, uh, you know, th it, this is a major safety issue, but the problem is not uh, the forest itself. The problem is that the utility equipment itself is what is igniting these fires, is what set off the fires north of San Francisco in the October 2017 firestorm event. And it's generally speaking the main problem. And uh, it's, in my research, I discovered that finally electrical, electrical engineers have resolved this issue. Equipment is now available which can detect a parted conductor, in other words, a broken wire, and shut off current to that wire before it even touches the earth. This equipment is for sale by several international companies. Uh, Switzerland, Canada, in the United States, and it's being installed by San Diego Gas and Electric. So th this is not uh, deep science. This is something that's already underway. What's going? What the problem is that PG&E doesn't like spending money on its infrastructure, and t to make a make that really obvious. Uh, a Public Utilities Commission investigation discovered that uh, nearly a billion dollars in funds that were set aside for undergrounding, which is another way of mitigating the problem, erasing the problem of a utility caused wildfires, a billion dollars was uh, unspent in this program that could have been used in the most fire prone locations to solve this. So I'm going to pass out this. I not. It, by the time it has all its attachments to it, it'll probably be 200 pages long because there are so many engineering reports and so forth that I need to include to as supporting documentation. But the real point is that PG&E has an obligation to upgrade its circuits to standards that where they are not igniting the fires. These fires are not ignited just because there is a forest up there. They're ignited because their equipment is fragile, uninsulated, made up of old wires, failing splices, etc. Thank you. And to what extent the county can help us with this, we would much appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome back. Hello, board members. Mary Jo Walker. I'm in, uh, staying along with the theme of uh, PG&E. Um, along the theme of PG&E, uh, Kevin mentioned that there, he sees down wires frequently. In front of our house, my house, uh, two times a wire has gone down. One time, it was about five years ago, and it was uh, down on the ground uh, sparking for uh, two days. 
uh, more than 48 hours. It was during a big storm, PG&E was very busy. The fire chief had to come out in the pouring rain uh, to uh, you know, set up barriers. And the second time was just about a year ago. And um, it came down and it was, uh, the whole street was lit, uh, sparking wires uh, for a long way. And there was a young woman coming up, driving her car, just about ready to go over that wire. She probably would have been electrocuted if it weren't for my husband shouting at her, stop, stop, stop. And she thought that they were flares that somebody had set up and she was about ready to drive over it. Very scary. Um, okay, but the real purpose I'd like to talk about is uh, Senate Bill uh, 1088, 1088. You may have heard about it. Uh, it was authored by Senator Dodd from Napa, which burned, of course, it is known as the Utility Infrastructure Safety Reliability and Accountability Act. Um, it has been amended significantly since it was introduced earlier this year. It passed the Senate already and is currently making its way through the Assembly. Um, it has many whereases in it, about 30 whereases, uh, including statements like uh, the investment in, in reducing the risk of wildfire fires has proven cost has a proven cost savings ratio of three to one, but the PUC has failed to establish adequate standards to reduce the risk caused by utility company equipment. Another statement, the PUC should require gas and electric companies to harden their systems. The PUC should require gas and electric companies to evaluate and incorporate um, techno technological solutions. The new law would require the Office of Emergency Services, OES, to establish standards uh, for investor-owned utilities uh, like PG&E to increase their safety, reliability, resilience. So utilities would then be required to pass a plan uh, that would include things like um, protocols for disab disabling disclosures, actions that would harden their system, vegetation management, and so on and so forth. I can't, I don't have time to list them all. Uh, there has been some opposition to the bill because there is language near the end of the bill that leads some people to believe that it would allow the gas and electric companies who have prepared these plans to pass the cost uh, on to um, the ratepayers. I don't know if it's a good bill, but I would like to ask your board to direct staff to look at the adequacy, look at the bill and determine whether it's adequate to require PG&E to update their equipment to be more accountability, and it will not allow PG&E to pass the cost along to us. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Good morning, welcome back, thanks for waiting. Good morning, thanks, I'm Kimla McDaniel Keith and I'm here to say thank you for passing the August 2018 World Breastfeeding Month Proclamation. Isn't it nice to have something that's not controversial? <laughs> I'm guessing it took you two minutes to agree to this. It's such good public health. Breastfeeding is so important for mothers, for children and for communities. And Santa Cruz is the rock star in breastfeeding. You already know we were rated number one in the state for exclusive breastfeeding in the hospital. That's the first time we've been number one. We've been number two and number three, but now we're number one. Watsonville Hospital is our third of three hospitals to become baby friendly. And if you don't know what that means, I can tell you we all have PTSD from going through that process. It's a very grueling process, but in the end, it's the best thing for mothers and babies. And Watsonville Hospital, we are so glad, has now achieved that status also in addition to Dominican and Sutter. And then this latest news, Community Bridges WIC getting a national award. It's so amazing. And they have been pathbreakers in breastfeeding support in the country for WIC programs. So there's a lot to celebrate in our community. I thank you for your proclamation. I want to make a personal invitation to you to have another feel-good moment come Friday, 3 to 6, Watsonville Plaza, um, for the WIC Breastfeeding Walk. You'll be so glad you did to see our community come together on something that really lifts us all up. Thank you again. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, I'm Sally Williams and I'm appearing on behalf of Margaret Ann Carota and Paul Carota on item number 12. Okay. And I just wanna let you know that we've reached a settlement with the county and the item may be removed. The, uh, the appeal is being rescinded. Thank you, so this is on the public hearing to consider the petition for rescission of the March 2017 tax sale, the assessor's parcel number 0409109. Nine, correct? Correct. Located with an aptos. You're asking that that item be withdrawn because you've reached a settlement? That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. So we will withdraw item 12 when the time comes. We appreciate you coming in to let us know about the settlement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, morning. welcome. Good morning, Chairman Z uh, Jack Bebe. Let me start again. Good morning, uh, Chairman Friend and the entire Board of Supervisors. My name is Stephen Matsey. 
And I am the 60 plus senior program coordinator for the Diversity Center of Santa Cruz County. I am honored to speak before you this morning about a group of people that I'm very passionate about, and that is our LGBTQ older adults, and to identify to you how your support through core funding has enabled us to provide opportunities for them to enrich their lives, bring them empowerment, and celebrate who they are. But first, a few key statistics that I'd like to share with you. Imagine growing up during a time where it was illegal to be who you are. You fear losing your job or being committed to a mental health facility simply because you were LGBTQ. It wasn't until 1973 when homosexuality was removed from the DSM of psychiatric disorders. This is the lived experience for many of our county's LGBTQ older adults. This lifetime of stigma and discrimination has um, led to apprehension in accessing mainstream services. They are more likely to age alone. They are often estranged from their biological families. They are twice as likely to be single in comparison to their heterosexual elders. They are three times more likely to have no children. This diminished support can lead to increased social isolation, which has been well documented to have adverse effects on their physical and emotional well-being. But now the great news. Through your support, through core funding, you have helped the Diversity Center hire me as a part-time program coordinator. During this past fiscal year, we have served 743 duplicated LGBTQ seniors through a variety of activities, including the five bi-monthly all-senior luncheons and 12 senior women and men's social event gatherings. We have also provided two sessions so far of the wellness-based, wellness initiative for senior education, evidence-based curriculum. But there is more work to be done. More outreach is necessary to identify and connect more LGBTQ elders to the 60 plus senior program, especially those who identify as Latinx and in our South County. Our elders have expressed a desire for LGBTQ specific support groups and we need to continue to bring more visibility to these resilient and diverse members of Santa Cruz County and awareness to our mainstream community partners about their unique needs. So in closing, I stand here in gratitude and thank you for the support you have shown myself, the Diversity Center, and our amazing LGBTQ seniors through core funding and look forward to our ongoing partnership. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, thank you for your work. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name is Karen Ashra and I've been in the county for 40 years. I'm a member of the Diversity Center and one of the first people that attended the Pride program which was really great because, you know, during my career, I retired maybe a couple years ago, I had to work out of the county to support myself here and my property <laughs> to pay the taxes and such. And um, I kind of lost touch with my community and old friends and everything and anyway, through the program I really have gained a lot in terms of uh, reconnecting with people and reconnecting and going to the social events and the luncheons and it's been really great and I really I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate this opportunity to come and speak to you. My name is Enrique Ortiz Villegas. I'm 75 years old. People say I don't look like it, but I, I don't act like it either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to speak about how Stephen Matsey's program in 60 plus has affected my life. As an artist now for 51 years, um, much of my time has been spent in, well, uh, as I say, much of my time is spent in doing my artwork, so I'm alone a lot. Sometimes I've even thought, who even knows I'm here in my workspace? I've been involved with the, the gay community here, mostly on the fringes, until Stephen, Stephen Matsy came along. I was um, a member of the first gay men support group that he brought to us, and from that I met a fellow participant who had the same voice teachers I did, Michelle Rivard, the best voice teacher at Cabrillo College, now retired. Together, we put together a song 
presentation of hits from Mae West, K-Star, Rosemary Clooney, and Connie Francis as an entertainment for uh, the 60 plus luncheons that Stephen has uh, brought us all together for. His work with us has really brought me out of my reclusiveness to help uh, and, and forwarding our goals as a gay community and also helping me to develop further in my community involvement. I wish that there were more time um, to say how much I enjoy his support. I appreciate his passion and concern and high regard for seniors, the gay seniors here in Santa Cruz County. Without that, I would still be in my workspace doing my artwork. Um, I think I said really what I wanted to say and, and my support for Stephen. I applaud his work and even this morning I got an email from him asking for Spanish speakers to come and help at Pride in Watsonville. I volunteered this morning. All right, so um, again, I'm really grateful to Stephen. I'm really grateful for the development of the Diversity Center here in, Cal in Santa Cruz County. I moved away twice, came back twice. Second time, I declared myself a permanent resident of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Good morning, welcome, thank you for waiting. Hi, I'm David Crane. I'm recovering from a hip replacement, so I'm a little unsteady on my feet. Um, I'm a member of the 60 plus diversity center group, and we've all been in this together. Uh, I had to learn to live around the edges as a young man. I fought for my rights. I became <coughs> successful in life. And um, because we're aging, I don't want to see us go back into living around the edges again because of isolation, because of lack of services. And that's why I'm here to support the Diversity Center. I thank them so much. Through Stephen's work, I uh, recovered from my hip surgery and I've now become president of the Residents Association at Garfield Park Village. And I thank you all for all your help that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, my name is Bob Pittman. I'm a um, member of the Diversity Center also, and I wanted to share with you a little bit about um, the impact that the Diversity Center has made on my life and that of my husband, David. Um, we lived up in Vancouver, Washington for a number of years and we were losing our housing. And we, we finally got onto uh, the list that got us into Garfield Park Village. Uh, but it was Stephen Matsey's leadership at the Diversity Center that not just helped us get down here, but helped make the move something that, that made sense to us. And we got down here and we were welcomed. We found homes, we found friends. We were taught how to get around and, and we were invited to gatherings. And for the first time in 23 years that we've been together, we have got lots of friends. We are accepted, we're welcomed. And that's not just, of course, the diversity center, but it's the, uh, it's the welcoming spirit of Santa Cruz as a whole. And th this community, the, the broader community, has been a wonderful place for us to land and thrive. And it's the, the, the help through the Diversity Center that has given us a, a chance to be centered and to, uh, to put down roots. And for that, we, we've really appreciated our association with it and we'll look forward to 
additional support from all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and the Diversity Center for this great programming. It's great to hear the testimony, but uh, I know how successful the program is. I'm glad Santa Cruz County is part of funding it. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, and welcome back to you. I hope you had a nice vacation. My name is Becky Steinbruner. I live in the mountains of Aptos. And first of all, I want to register protests that you have now combined public comment on items not on the agenda with consent agenda comment that effectively reduces the total amount of public input time, and I don't think it's fair. I also want to register protests that now members of the public are no longer able to pull items from the consent agenda for better public discussion. We are at your mercy to do so. I register that protest now, and do not think it's in keeping with a strategic Santa Cruz plan for better government transparency. As a mountain resident, I also want to second the comments that you've heard this morning about the PG&E uh, swaths of tree removal. I live in a mountain area. I live on a privately maintained road. This kind of action will cause severe erosion in all of the watershed areas and for roadways in the county. So I uh, urge you to follow the advice that the speakers before me have suggested. I also want to say that um, I would like your board to establish a youth commission that includes members of all local high schools, alternative high schools included, and I want to see more involvement from the youth in our community with your decisions and discussions on public policy changes, policy making, um, impacts of things that will affect their lives here in the county into the future. That will need to be evening meetings, and so then I would ask now that you hold one evening meeting a week, um, a month, that could then include a commission of youth from our area schools. We need to involve the youth in our community and in our government policy making, and I urge you to do so. On the consent agenda, I want to just say hooray for the Pinto Lake bike pump track. That's really good news that that's going in, something for the youth to do that's free and healthy, and I really applaud the county's efforts doing those kinds of things. I want to comment on item 39, an additional $825,000 being spent on the uh, Valencia Road emergency culvert repair. That big project now totals over $6.2 million, and I want to ask that um, County Public Works do regular inspections of culverts throughout the county. That one failed, and that very expensive expenditure may have been averted had there been some preemptive work or earlier inspections to alert the needed to be repairs there. And, and finally, because I've got one second, I just want to say that the CAO said the effectiveness of the reduction of Thank consent you. will be there will be fewer consent poll. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, Chairman, friend, and board. Um, I'm Bob Langseth, the Executive Director of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Santa Cruz County, and I'm here today to thank you for your support through core programming. Uh, we now have three sites in the county. Uh, we are serving in well in excess of 400 kids every day this summer. But more importantly, I'm here to thank uh, Jeff Gaffney and County Parks for their partnership in helping us put on the very first Live Oak Fun Run for the community. On September 22nd, we will be co-hosting a run of 3K, and you're welcome, <laughs> 3K, 5K, and 10K um, distances. So we invite you to join us out at Simpkins where the start and finish line and after party will all happen. It's a great event and it's really exciting to partner with uh, the county parks to put on something like this for the Live Oak community. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for your work. Thank you. Sufar so Leopold has been training very heavily for that race, and yeah. so we're anticipating him to take the gold. If you want to see me in shorts, that's the day to come. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm Robbie gonzalez Dow with Community Bridges WIC program, and I thank you so much for proclaiming August as Breastfeeding Awareness Month. 
and you heard from my colleagues and friends all the good news in Santa Cruz is number one in the state for exclusive breastfeeding rates in the hospital. Fortunately, at three months, that drops to about 44%. And one of the main reasons is because parents return to work and they're not getting the support in the workplace to continue to breastfeed without a private space, free from inclusion. Laws, federal and state laws require that employers provide a private space in time for parents to pump at work. And so we're asking you for your support to help encourage employers to follow those laws. Um, with the, I'm able to help employers free of cost. That's part of my job at Community Bridges to offer technical assistance to, with workplace policy, training to help employers to implement lactation support in the workplace. We have some standout employers in our county. One is Ryder Berry Farms. I've helped assisted them and they support women who work in the fields to, to pump while they're at work. And I also asked this, the county to be one of those standout workplaces uh, with a workplace, workplace policy and ensuring that all employees in the county know about the policy and, um, and have support in the workplace to continue to breastfeed. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Hi, Good morning. welcome back from your break. Um, my name is Paul DeSoma, I'm a Live Oak resident. Uh, the issue I am concerned with is the uh, Verizon 5G rollout of the infrastructure for the small cell antennas that uh, is aggressively being um, pushed on communities, uh, not just in Santa Cruz, uh, but in uh, the entire Bay Area. You may or may not be aware that the city of Santa Rosa in July has placed a pause on any new approval of applications for these installations for a number of reasons, uh, one being that they felt Verizon was not being a fair uh, partner in communication with the municipality and uh, aggressively pushing their, their agenda. Um, it's uh, obvious that the board is interested in public health, evidenced by so many uh, approving speakers today. So the one issue is is definitely health. There's lots of uh, evidence available to make your own decision about whether this this technology is uh, dangerous or um, or not. Um, there's uh, you know, and you can make your own decision about that. That's not really my biggest issue. My biggest issue is that it's being forced on neighborhoods, and in the potential that it's harmful, uh, it should be well considered the distances from. Uh, residences and and homes and such. Um, there's, uh, I know that I've been told that there's little that the municipality can do to oppose this. Um, I have, I would really like to hear three minutes from somebody or any of you on this board as to why you may think it's a good idea to follow through with the plan as proposed by Verizon. This, I want to submit this to public record, is a, a letter from a law firm hired by uh, the EMF Safety Network in um, Sebastopol. It's uh, from a law firm that outlines what municipalities can do in opposition or at least, you know, to uh, not oppose but just to work with the telecom industry on um, uh, what they can do. Um, so I'll, I'll give that to you. Um, John, I, we're gonna see you at uh, the constituent meetings and, and hopefully talk a little bit more about this. And uh, I, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Thank you. Um, Marilyn Garrett, part of Wireless Radiation Alert Network. Uh, the damage of microwave radiation is well substantiated. And since I've been coming here, since I retired from teaching in 2000, you have all been supplied with uh, the substantiated health impacts. Um, this is a very sad time for me because in 1945, August 6th and August 9th, the U.S. dropped nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and killing over 100,000 each time. And the U.S. continues to develop nuclear weapons and we are, uh, nuclear disaster is on the 
horizon and it's not stopped. Now, I've read about nuclear, by the way, let me say this before I forget. Part of PG&E's clear cut plans seem to be to clear the trees out of the way for this 5G wireless microwave technology from satellites as well as on the ground. Uh, I've read about nuclear bombs on poles. There's an article by Amy Worthington called The Radiation Poisoning of America. In it, there's a letter from, she opens up talking about these fire lookouts at Likely Mountain overlooking Shasta. And these two women who became quite ill with radiation burns, turns out there was a cell tower right there. Their jewelry burned on their skin. They had blood abnormalities. One of them lost a third of her body weight, radiation anorexia. Um, now, part of that article, I'm just going to read a little bit until I run out of time. Painful conditions endured by the families of Garcia and Jasson, I'm going to give you one of their statements, are identical to those suffered by Japanese victims of gamma wave radiation after nuclear explosions at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Five decades of studies confirm that non-ionized communications radiation in the radio frequency microwave spectrum has the same effect on human health as um, ionizing gamma wave radiation. I think my tremors are totally related to this exposure. Um, and they quoting an expert, uh, Dr. Heo Eco, uh, whose um, German Medical Association stated, the symptoms that result from uh, radioactive radiation are identical to the effects of electromagnetic radiation. Thank you. The damages are so similar that they are hard to be differentiated. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We need you to protect the public from this onslaught. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, my name is Eileen Clark Nagaoka, and I'm a resident of Watsonville, and I'm a member of um, Regeneration, which is a, um, a local to Watsonville uh, climate action group. Uh, um, we seek to uh, work on uh, the problem of climate change through uh, local initiatives, and we, I'm just here to tell you about uh, a survey we did, our community survey, um, we surveyed 350 people and we were really happy that we were able to um, get a cross-section of, of Watsonville proportionate to the demographics there, So, uh, which was our goal. And, and uh, um, I just wanted to let you know about it and, and um, what our major findings were. It was conducted by community volunteers um, in uh, January and February. Um, and uh, so the, our major findings were that uh, uh, a large majority of, of agricultural workers find that their work, um, of both them, themselves and their family members, um, has been has had a has been highly impacted by extreme weather, both heat and and extreme weight, uh, rain, um, long long periods of rain because of the loss of work and also health the the health, health impacts they have during uh, high heat times. Um, another was the pesticides were a huge concern. That was the second a major finding. And the third was that um, people really want a better access to uh, to local organic agriculture. Um, so um, we I'm just here to let you know about that, and and we're very proud that we were able to uh, complete the. Uh, complete the survey it was um, we got advice and training from um, Dr. Shashir Mather, who is um, um, Dean of Research at San Jose State University Social Science Department. And then also I wanted to invite you to come to the local, uh, to the Global Climate Action Summit. Uh, you may have heard about this already. It'll be taking place in San Francisco, September 12th through the 14th, and lots of um, um, uh, local officials from all over the state will be there, and I'll leave the flyer here for you about it. So uh, it should be a very uh, positive and um, 
a powerful uh, gathering, and I, I hope you'll you'll all make it. Can I leave this with someone? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Welcome back, Ms. Roberts. Good morning. Chair and board, thank you for uh, listening to all of us. I'll be brief. I just wanted to thank you, um, Supervisor McPherson and Coonerty, uh, regarding item number 23 on the consent agenda uh, about the resolution to oppose uh, Proposition 6, which is the repeal of the gas tax. Um, we think that SB1 uh, and the funds that it provides as, I'm sorry, Kate Roberts, President of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, um, that transportation is such an important issue that we uh, have taken on just recently as an organization, and this funding would be uh, very important to carry forward uh, many, many projects here specific to Santa Cruz County, as well as the other two um, counties that MBEP is covering in Monterey County and San Benito County, but specific to Santa Cruz County, it's um, over $115 million in funding that would not come to this county to do road repairs, um, expanding and um, 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 widening of roads, bike lanes, bridge repairs, all sorts of projects that are actually identified that would not happen if this money were to be repealed. So I just wanted to thank you for your leadership in putting that resolution forth, and we're very supportive of that and hope to see that uh, Prop 6 get defeated come November. Um, secondly, on the housing bond, I won't say anything now. I know there's going to be a separate discussion for that, but MBEP has been on the sidelines supporting that effort uh, for a long time, and uh, I have some staff here that will speak later to that, but we're looking forward to seeing that get on the ballot, so thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Chair Friend, members of the board. I'm Ellen Timberlake, the Director of the Human Services Department, and I am very pleased this morning to introduce you to our new Director of our Employment and Benefit Services Division, Kimberly Peterson. As you all know, the division serves one in three residents in our county, and we couldn't be any more thrilled to have this division under Kimberly's leadership. She's been with the county for 13 years started as an eligibility worker, has been a program coordinator, analyst, and most recently our program manager in our Watsonville Service Center. So it is really my pleasure to introduce her to you and the public, and I just wanted to take this opportunity. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, Ms. Peterson. Thank you for your work in general. Is there anybody else that would like to address this during public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it to the board to go through the consent agenda. These items uh, 14 through uh, a number higher than 14 somewhere that I don't see immediately on my agenda. But either way, this is the consent agenda. We'll start with Supervisor Caput. Are there any comments you'd like to make or any items you'd like to pull from the consent agenda, items 14 to 47? No, but I would uh, like a clarification on, uh, <coughs> maybe it's just an error or something on number 19 uh, of the public defender's offices in Watsonville. Uh, it does say on page 156 that uh, janitorial services are included in the uh, price for the leasing. And then on page 158 it says that the lessor can then uh, submit to the, uh, to the county to uh, pay for janitorial services. So uh, what, what is it? Who, who is paying for the janitorial services? That, it's not a big deal, but it, it, is, uh, it is money. Please, Mr. Palacios. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we can get to you that answer to see if somebody, well, here's uh, yeah. one of our analysts um, can answer the question, Sven. Yeah, the, uh, say my name's Sven Stafford. I'm an analyst in the county administrative office. Uh, the costs of the janitorial service are included as part of the lease, but as they're charged every month, they're remitted to the county for payment through the lease. Okay, is it included in the amounts that we're voting on in the consent agenda, or is it an unknown amount each month that if they submit? Um, it should be a standard amount every month, and it'll be included in the lease, but in the event that there are extra services provided, we would also cover those. Okay, thank you. And then item number uh, 20, uh, that's the uh, uh, response from the uh, Santa Cruz, uh, from the Board of Supervisors Health Services uh, concerning mental health crisis, integrated response uh, 
to the uh, grand jury. Uh, I agree with uh, some of the uh, uh, responses to the grand jury, but I don't agree with uh, a number of them, and I don't want to get into too big a de detail here. But uh, so I'm going to vote no on that. Uh, no, item number 20. Uh, item 25 is related to 19. I think that was answered well. And then uh, item 34, uh, looking forward to the pump track uh, at Pinto Lake uh, coming in, looks like around October. And uh, it's a good program. Um, I'm wondering, uh, do, you, do we know the exact total cost on that? Uh, there was some money coming in, some money coming out. I know we got a grant for $10,000 going towards it. And so uh, do, you have a, do you have an answer on that? I don't want to make it a big deal. But. Is the question what the contract amount is for or what the net county cost yeah. is? Because the contract amount is for 1085 um, $108,500 is the con total right. contract then amount. then there was uh, added expenses, is that correct? Director Gaffney, if you want to provide clarification. Thank you for being here this morning, Director Gaffney. Thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, we are still working on the numbers, and when we're finalizing the contract, we'll have a, a set amount, but we did have to add an additional $20,000. The bids came in about actually 30000 over what we anticipated, so that's kind of the, the going process lately. It, it would be about 128, 130. Well, we added another 10 from the grant, and then we also have another grant coming in, so the numbers won't be finalized until the actual construction's done. It's, it's kind of a process as they go through, as change orders come in, that sort of thing. So yeah. So the current contract is 108.5 that the board's actually adopting, but at the end, we will ratify any changes that needed to come in. Exactly. That'll be fine. Thank you for that. Thanks. Looking forward to the grand opening. Yes, we all are. It's exciting. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, on, uh, thank to um, address item number 23, uh, resolution that I uh, co-signed with um, Supervisor Coonerty opposing Proposition 6 on uh, the November ballot. Uh, this would, uh, if it does pass, it would eliminate about $115 million coming to Santa Cruz County, about 50 million of that in the unincorporated area, plus about $65 million over the next 10 years to our four cities. Uh, already you've, uh, in my district, we've seen some improvements that are being made. I think the general public has too, with the so-called Senate SB1, Senate Bill 1 funding in remote areas like Bear Creek Road, Lompico Road, and Jameson Creek Road. Um, we just can't take care of our county and the needs, especially from the storm damages of the, the recent uh, years that we've had. Uh, do it alone is gonna take a long time. Uh, it's absolutely necessary that we keep this, and I think it's important to know that state voters overwhelmingly in June uh, passed a state proposition that guarantees that uh, funds identified for transportation purposes will stay for that purpose. Uh, it's, uh, the state has had a a bad record of uh, kind of stealing from transportation uh, funds to put it in other areas of the state budget, uh, but that will no longer happen. So um, it's, it's reassuring to see that that money would stay for road and uh, bridge, bikeways, and all kinds of transportation purposes. Um, critically needed in our county, um, if we wanna get our roads fixed, uh, this is going to be a huge step for us to uh, accomplish that in a, a reduced number of years for sure. <laughs> Um, and then on number item 38, uh, Glenwood Drive storm da damage repair. Um, I'm pleased that Caltrans is helping uh, make repairs on Glenwood Drive, uh, which was damaged in the storm of 2011. And that's how, how long it takes sometimes to repair these roads without state or federal help that we're getting from this uh, Senate Bill 1 that I just mentioned. And I know a, a residents up there appreciated the work that's getting done, and I want to thank Public Works for getting this item for, for us today. Uh, it's very much appreciated and very much needed, so thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Hi. Good morning, Mr. Chair, 
uh, members of our community. Just a couple items to comment on, as Supervisor McPherson mentioned and Kate Roberts from the Monterey Bay Economic uh, Partnership mentioned, uh, we are encouraging voters to make sure they stay educated and vote no on Proposition 6. Uh, this gas tax repeal would have a tremendous impact on our infrastructure, and I think the most important thing is that uh, by eliminating this funding source, it eliminates preventative uh, efforts to protect our infrastructure against the ravages of climate change, which means we all end up spending more money in the long term and are being uh, and having our roads impacted uh, in the short term while we try while we try to get across the county. On item number 35, uh, and I know many people in the audience are here to support affordable housing, and I appreciate uh, you all taking time to be here this morning. On item number 35, uh, I'm proud that the county has partnered with Habitat for Humanity to develop a vacant parcel uh, on Harper Street and to get 11 affordable units for families in our community, uh, and that that project's moving forward. And then finally, on item number 37, the Swanton Bridge uh, replacement. Uh, this has been a long time in the making of getting that bridge repaired. Uh, it's important for people to maintain access and also for public safety access. Uh, and I want to commend Public <coughs> Works for moving this, uh, moving that, uh, this repair forward. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Just a couple things. Uh, on the minutes uh, from our meeting on June 26th, uh, 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 which is item G, 15G, uh, it was about the, uh, uh, the changes in our policy procedures. It, there are five different things on here. I think number two should be struck. Uh, it, it, number three says we adopted the, the Rosenberg rules. Uh, number four is approve the consent items um, requirement about board members and the oral and, commu uh, and consent communication being together. And returning, and the last uh, five is directing to come back in, in six months. That was what we actually voted on. Uh, and there was some confusion as evidence in today's uh, uh, having to move around the uh, agenda about number two. So I'm just asking that it be struck. Uh, on item number 28, I want to uh, uh, appreciate our uh, interim director of health services and her work in trying to work with Janice. Uh, to help them identify additional sources of fund. They're an important program. We've heard from uh, uh, the, those who work there about the need for uh, a, additional pay and uh, county working with uh, our nonprofit partners uh, to find out how to leverage more money is really helpful uh, to them and helpful to us. And I really appreciate the work that you did uh, to make that happen. On item number 33, I just want to uh, express my appreciation to the uh, uh, Human Services Department uh, for uh, the renewal of this Prop 39 pre-apprenticeship training implementation grant. Uh, in reading about the grant, uh, it, it, to get people into these pre-apprenticeship training program and move them into jobs uh, has proven to be very successful, and I appreciate the work mm -hmm. of Human mm -hmm. Services to make sure that we continue this program. Um, on item 42, I want to uh, also thank the, uh, 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 our Parks Department for their continued work on um, getting the Heart of Soquel Linear Parkway project uh, completed. Uh, there's a lot of different parts to it, but uh, I appreciate your doggedness in, in terms of making this happen, so thank you. Uh, and uh, lastly, I will invite uh, all my uh, colleagues and members of the public on September 22nd to the Live Oak Family Fun Run. Uh, it's going to be a good time, and we're really glad to see that in Live Oak. And thanks to the Parks Department for making that happen with the Boys and Girls Club. That's it. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. So note that there's a proposed for an amendment on item 15. Uh, G. I have no additional comments beyond my, co my colleagues' comments on Prop 6, Habitat for Humanity, and uh, Pinto Lake, so I'll just ask that one of my colleagues now make a motion in regards to the consent agenda. I move the consent agenda as amended. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a, super, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. We have Supervisor Caput registering a no vote on item 20. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously with that one no vote on item 20. 
We'll now move into the regular agenda. The first item on the regular agenda is item four, is to consider report and resolution to provide for the submission of a proper Proposition incurring bonded debt of a maximum of 140 million for the purpose of financing affordable housing projects and programs to the qualified voters of the County of Santa Cruz at the general election to be held on November 6, 2018. To take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisors Friend and Coonerty, we have a resolution and order calling election for the bond measure. Uh, good morning, Ms. Reno. Thank you for kicking this item off. Uh, good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. Um, at your direction, in June and July, the County Administrative Office convened the Interjurisdictional Housing Task Force to develop affordable housing options that can be created using funding opportunities in the form of bonds recommended by the Affordable Housing Santa Cruz Group, which was led by Fred Keeley and Don Lane. The committee met five times to refine the original program proposed and to develop the affordable housing recommendations presented today in your board memo. So this is just a quick snapshot of those in our community that are impacted by high housing costs and may face housing insecurity. It affects all levels of income, um, including moderate income families in our community. Um, most housing guidelines um, recommend um, that housing costs um, uh, be a standard of 30% of income to be spent on housing. The more households spend on housing, the less they have for other necessities such as food, clothing, transportation, health care. In addition, there are fewer discretionary dollars that can be spent at local businesses. However, in Santa Cruz County, we see a major housing affordability gap. And that's the um, uh, change between the market rate housing cost um, and affordable housing. Um, these charts show that the gap at various income levels based on our median income of $77,613. So we have a median home price here now over $900,000 and the average rent here for a two bedroom apartment is about $3,200. So you can see at the various levels of um, area median income what the gap is, and that's that little red band there um, in the chart for meeting housing needs. Um, you can see that for those in the lower income households, meeting any kind of housing needs here is almost an impossibility. A monthly rental cost of $3,200 is almost 55% of the monthly medium income for the area. And for a low income household, that same rent would constitute nearly 62% of their income. A solution that has been proposed by the local housing advocates Adv housing advocacy group is to generate funding through a local bond measure. This funding could be used to create more affordable housing and homeless facilities and could also be leveraged to help um, local jurisdictions become more competitive for state and federal funding dollars. This solution has been used successfully in other jurisdictions throughout the United States. The recommendations before you today are for a housing bond measure of 140 million with 119 million to be dedicated to creating more affordable housing units allocated amongst the jurisdictions and 21 million to be dedicated to funding needed facilities for homelessness and that is to be allocated as one regional sum. The Interjurisdictional Housing Task Force determined that the funding should be allocated to and controlled by each individual jurisdiction in order to meet the specific needs of that community. Funding allocations for jurisdictions were calculated using the combined equally weighted statistics of population, regional housing needs, poverty levels, and total assessed value. These numbers would be updated prior to the issuance of each bond series for the most up-to-date calculation. And this slide shows you about what the um, total allocation would be for each jurisdiction. The affordable housing bonds would be financed through a property tax assessment not to exceed $16.77 per $100,000 of assessed value over a period not to exceed 40 years. The bonds would be issued in two separate series with a 30-year payback for each series. 
The first series would be for 100 million and issued somewhere in 2019 or 2020. And the second series would be for 40 million and we estimated that it would be issued in 2027, though we could push that out. The chart indicates the payback schedule for the bonds. For the first series, the annual payback would be about 7.8 million or approximately $16.32 per 100,000 assessed value. And once the second series was issued, the annual payback would increase to 8.6 million or a maximum of $16.77 per 100,000 of assessed value. And then of course the payback amount drops as the series are, a bond series are paid off. This chart shows the estimated um, uh, payments for $100,000 of assessed value over the life of the two series of bonds with a peak amount of $16.77 and then declining over time. The regional housing needs assessment projects a need of about 1,214 units for the low and very low area uh, median income and about 1,768 units if you also include the area, um, the moderate area median income group through the year 2023. It is estimated based on potential projects in each jurisdiction that an estimated 1,041 units could be produced using these bond funds. <coughs> That's the conclusion of the presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for that wonderful, concise presentation. It's very helpful. Are there any questions from board members before we open this up for public comment on this item? Sure. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, a, a question. You, you said not to exceed 40 years. That's correct. It would depend on when the second series of bonds is issued. So if we issue the bonds in seven years, then it would be 37 total years of bond payments. If we issued it um, 10 years from the time of the first issuance, then that would be 40 years. Right. And then uh, uh, the other would be, uh, we're going by assessed value of the property rather than the market rate at the time of the uh, uh, taxing. It's assessed value, right. correct. Okay, and assessed value. I, I guess the only concern I have is that uh, we have senior citizens that are on a fixed income. Maybe they <coughs> paid for their house and or their home, and then uh, their property tax would be based on their purchase price maybe 20 or something years earlier. That's correct. Well, assessed value is always typically much lower yeah. than the market rate value. Yeah, because that would be under Prop 13, right? Okay, and then uh, it's $16.77 per $100,000 on assessed value of property. Just trying to clarify it. That's correct. We're, we're voting to put whether or not to put this on the ballot and letting the people vote in the county. And the last question, just to make it clear too, is it would require uh, 60, it's a specific tax. It's not for something else that the general fund can uh, take and use for it, something else. No, there would be a special uh, fund set up for, for allocating these dollars and they could, the bonds restrict the way you can use the funding so it couldn't be used for anything other than capital investments for housing. And requires six, well about 67% to pass. Uh, it's a two thirds right. uh, at, uh, the vote, at the polls, it's a two thirds point, vote, yeah. yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Sure, I just wanna take a moment before we begin to thank um, Don Lane and Fred Keeley and all the people involved in creating this, um, bringing this forward, and then the county staff to be able to take um, what is essentially a concept and figure out how to divide it across five jurisdictions and of the variety of housing needs we have in the community. Um, I think this is an exciting opportunity to address a real crisis in our community that's impacting virtually every aspect uh, of our of our of our county um, and the fact that we built in and understand that we, there's no one solution to our housing problems. It requires a multi-pronged approach, it requires supporting seniors, it requires uh, supporting our homeless community, creating ADUs, creating uh, affordable developments. Uh, it, it takes a multi-pronged approach and that uh, with this we'll have funds that we can leverage hopefully against state funds, against federal funds, against uh, other affordable housing funds 
funds that we collect uh, in order to get some projects going and help provide some relief to, to especially working families who are struggling to make it in this community. Um, and so I don't wanna, it, it, you know, when it comes neatly packaged in a PowerPoint, uh, everyone uh, feels good about it, but I wanna acknowledge all the people who put in the effort to get us to this point uh, that we can put something hopefully before the voters that that um, that can help address the crisis in our community. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. I know that board members will probably have additional comments, but I think the most important thing is having an opportunity for the community now to address us. So we'd now like to open it up uh, to the community now. Uh, just so I have a sense, how many people plan to speak to us today just so I can see how many minutes I should allocate here? Okay, so we'll, we'll have it at a two minute uh, per speaker. Uh, Good morning, welcome back. Uh, Mayor Emeritus, Council Member for Life, Don Lane. <laughs> Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Don Lane and I'm here representing Affordable Housing, Santa Cruz County. Um, I'm joined today by our group's other co-chair, Fred Keeley, and this is the place in my comments where I'm supposed to make a joke at Fred's expense about why he's not standing here next to me, but I'll share that with you offline another time. <laughs> However, I will repeat something Fred said to me, and I agreed with him when he said it. This could be the broadest countywide coalition created around a community issue in recent Santa Cruz County memory. Perhaps it's not really a surprise, though, that we've been able to build such a broad coalition. Um, everyone is touched by the housing crisis in Santa Cruz teachers, first responders, healthcare workers, farm workers, service workers, and so many other members of our community are struggling with, housing, with the housing crisis. Employers in retail, agriculture, hospitality, tech, healthcare see the housing crisis as they seek to find and retain employers, employees. People in the human services sector and the healthcare sector deal with individual people experiencing that housing crisis every single day. Renters line up for hours and search for months to find any place to live. Young families have set aside their dreams of home ownership. Seniors struggle every day to, uh, with rising rents and people without shelter struggle for survival every day. And at the same time, those that build truly affordable housing are poised to move ahead but are held back by a lack of funding. So we have been able to build a broad coalition and we have a few representatives of that coalition who are here to speak with you. Before I step aside for them, I want to um, just say a couple of things. Briefly. First, Please. first I'd like to invite everyone here today who came to support the housing bond to either stand or raise your hand. We are very proud of the all the folks from every sector and every district who've stepped up to help create this solution. And second, we'd like to thank the county staff members who stepped up over the last few months and to the staff from the local cities that collaborated with them to put together some of the key pieces that you saw today. Thank you so much for that help. And finally, we wanna thank the boards, members of the board who've played key roles in helping us get to this moment. We are here today to respectfully ask that you adopt the proposal before you. Please give the voters of our county an opportunity to turn what started as a broad community conversation about the housing crisis into a specific and concrete solution to address that crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, and Mr. we Lane. have a couple members of our coalition who'd also like to say. Perfect, thank you Mr. Lane. We'll call that a Santa Cruz two minutes for you. <laughs> Good morning, welcome Ms. Palmer, thank you for being here. Hi, I'm Barbara Palmer, I'm a realtor, but I am not here representing the California Association of Realtors, I am chairing their legislative committee, and I am not representing the local association because we haven't voted yet. But first of all, I wanna thank this board for doing what, everything you can to fix our housing problem and still protecting private property rights. You're com be commended for that. Number two, 
is there any way you can build into this some means testing, which means y can you take a look, we do have people that have been living in these homes for 40 years, they're on social security, adding layers of property tax, even though this one is affordable to most of us, but adding those taxes and layering them on is a concern for me and a concern for the people that maybe uh, it would be a burden. Not this one tax, but as you layer them on. In my area, we have Cabrillo College taxes. So just please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Jeffrey Smedberg. I was a county worker for a quarter of a century and active member of SEIU. Uh, my strong union afforded me a generous living wage and helped me purchase sm a small home in Santa Cruz and guaranteed me some re retirement security so I didn't have to move to Los Banos when I uh, leaving my county job. I still have time to be active in union affairs and I am vice president of the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council on whose behalf I'm speaking to you this morning. Uh, the, the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council is a regional union of 80 labor unions which represents 38,000 uh, working women and men in the Central Coast region. The functioning of our communities depends on local workers, including teachers, healthcare workers, service workers, farm workers, and many others. Most of our seniors, people with disabilities, and those without per permanent shelter also uh, at one time were part of our active workforce. Many of these workers are union members even though union workers on average earn 20% more than non-union wor union workers. Their circumstances are not all as favorable as mine. Uh, you are all aware of the huge disparity uh, in our community between housing costs and earnings. All working people and their families, as well as former workers, need affordable housing here, not in Los Banos. Uh, you know, there are county workers who live in Los Banos now and waste a lot of their time uh, adding uh, on the road, adding to the congestion. Uh, construction of affordable rental units and first-time homebuyer assistance leveraged by the Housing Solutions Bond will be a good start in tackling our housing crises. The Monterey Bay Central Labor Council, Council urges you to support the Housing Services Bond and place it on the November ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for waiting. Hi. Um, my name is Carmen Bernal. Um, in May, one of you were asked whether or not this bond was something that you would consider passing. And that particular Board of Supervisors said, I don't know because it may impact seniors it, that are on, and, or anyone that's on a fixed income. So I really want you to consider this because it will impact seniors. Um, one of my neighbors pays $10,000 in property taxes and of that property tax, she's paying over 1,700 towards bonds, measures, and for our area, uh, library facility. Depending upon where you live, like in Capitola, there are nine bonds and measures and library facilities that you pay for. In Santa Cruz, there are 10. We just keep on adding more and more. At one point, at what point is it enough? Sorry, I can't read this. I printed it too low, <laughs> too, too small. Why was the housing bond established as a bond instead of a measure, which could have exempted seniors at the age of 65? How long is this bond for? Well, you did explain it here, but I was shocked <laughs> at the duration. I'm not against housing. Mr. Uh, friend, you received an email from me and you got my background. So you know that I'm not against housing. I myself purchased a home through Measure J years ago Thank God for that program. But I just learned that in the last two years, the county has allowed a developer's choice to pay s fees rather than requiring affordable housing units being as part of the county's new housing project. So much for affordable housing. Thank you, please finish up. 
sorry, okay. <laughs> just, that's, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to let you know my opposition to it. I mean, when is enough enough? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Good morning, Councilmember Garcia, welcome. Good morning, uh, Chair and Board. My name is Rebecca Garcia, and I'm a native of Watsonville, and I happen to sit on the Watsonville City Council and on the Latino Affairs Commission. Watsonville first began addressing the serious need of affordable housing in 1991 when the city adopted its inclusionary ordinance. Today, August 7, 2018, the community of Watsonville that includes service workers, teachers, farm workers, seniors, homeless, and people with disabilities are saying, it's enough. We want affordable housing for all our residents. In Watsonville, we have two to three families living in single households because they cannot afford the rent. Some families have to live in substandard housing and in garages. So we are proposing to you, our county supervisors, that you place on the November ballot an initiative to provide affordable housing. Watsonville has three programs that provide support for affordable housing to middle income and low income residents. However, it's not enough to meet all the housing needs. The proposed plan will provide more funding for more people needing affordable housing in Watsonville. The first program is the inclusionary ordinance which provides 15 to 20 percent affordable units. Our second is the down payment assistance program and the third program is the first time home buyers program. These latter two programs are available to low and very low income residents. I support the passage of the bond because it will help the city of Watsonville support those individuals and families who struggle to meet their housing payments, and I hope you as supervisors also want to support them. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome, Councilmember Harlan. Good morning, supervisors. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't come here very often, but it's very interesting. Affordable housing, I've been part of the coalition since the beginning, and it's been a very interesting group, very broad-based. What I really like about it is that every city can do whatever they want with the money, whatever meets their needs. As you know, capital is pretty much built out. So we're not gonna be building very much unless we can do something with the mall, and they're not really interested in doing that right now. Because we have so many second homes in town, we have a huge decrease in the amount of homes that can be available for rentals. We have almost 50% of our R1 areas that are second homes, Depot Hill and the Jewel Box. It's very shocking. We have many opportunities to help though. We can buy, there's a couple of apartment complexes that I know of that I would love to buy to keep in affordable housing and to turn into affordable housing. We have one that used to be mostly section eight and a new owner bought it, but I would like to buy that back from them and help them. We gave, we gave Loma Vista Mobile Home Park almost a million dollars to buy themselves to keep it low and moderate income housing. We gave Wharf Road Manor about four or $500,000 to keep that in low and moderate income housing. We can do, we can continue to do that. As a tourist destination in a very small town, 1.6 square miles and 10,000 people, we need housing for the people that work and, and are able to, can live in our town. <clears throat> I'm very concerned about overdeveloping Santa Cruz County. It looks like we've already done that when you look at the traffic that we have. <clears throat> but I think we're working on that. And I encourage all of us to be very mindful about development in the future, that we don't continue to create problems for ourselves and the future of Capitola, Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Scotts Valley, and the unincorporated part of the county. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Harlan. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you. I'm Kathy Sarto, I'm a member of Peace United Church of Christ up by the university, which is one of 29 institutional members of COPA, a nonprofit, nonpartisan, uh, organization of dues paying members like congregations, schools, nonprofits, and unions. Um, 18 of the COPA men member institutions that are located in Santa Cruz County uh, are located in Santa Cruz County and about 20 of us are here today. Um, they have wrangled me to be the sole speaker so I'm speaking for all of us. <laughs> um, Many of our institutions have been at the forefront of seeking to make our communities better places for decades. Uh, COPA, COPA has been vocal about the need to create workforce housing. Uh, we helped move the county to pass its first housing element in 20 years. Uh, we've helped build senior housing at St. Stephen's and we've been conducting and continue to conduct civic academies um, on housing um, to, to uh, inform constituents about these complex issues and also to, um, to address re resistance. 
Um, the housing crisis affects each of us in a number of ways. It affects me personally in that I have five children who will never be able to buy a home in this county. Um, my eldest is a nurse who works for Hospice of Santa Cruz. Um, one of my sons works at our mental health facility across from Harbor High. My other son has an MBA. I have two daughters still in college. These are Santa Cruz's own kids, um, kids who did everything we asked. We asked them to get an education and contribute and give back to society. Um, our congregations are losing members and clergy. Our schools can't recruit teachers. Our health institutions can't recruit doctors and nurses, et cetera. At our COPA convention on September 30th, um, we hope to see you all there. Um, we'll be a, a large, housing will be a large part of our agenda and about a thousand people will be present to hear about this opportunity. So we would like to ask you to, um, to accept this staff um, recommendation to put this on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Good morning, welcome back. Chair, Supervisors, good morning. Uh, I represent, I'm the chair of the uh, Santa Cruz Coalition on Homelessness. I direct the Warming Center program in Santa Cruz. Uh, I've toured the, 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 the West Coast and I've seen 40 cities and seen what's happening out there at homelessness. Uh, money is coming and finally it's really good. And I, I, I would like to talk about design concepts. It doesn't matter how much money comes into this community if the design is poor. We've already been spending all of the money on virtually no f positive effect when you look at the homelessness on the street. It's mushrooming in every city. We could, with no money, with better design, do much more with less. That's what I want to have you thinking about through, through, through November, uh, doing more with less. In fact, no matter how much money, money we spend, are we still going to see elderly women in wheel, walkers and wheelchairs sleeping in our doorways? Are we going to have people in the, 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 the crevices and uh, under the Felton Bridge and everywhere else? Uh, so what I encourage, and, and with the Warming Center program, we spend very little money and we, we are scalable to infinity. Not one person has to sleep outside on the very coldest nights. We get zero funding for the city of Santa Cruz, a little bit of county funding for Watsonville for that. We also now have a program, we're in our third month, called the, the Day and Night Storage Program. It's scalable to infinity. We make sure that nobody has to carry around their belongings. We get zero funding from government for that. But I wanna see you say you can already see the impact on the street. Let's build programs. Let's actually make a com commitment countywide that every single person who sleeps outside can get the shelter that they need by any means necessary. And it's not about money, it's about perfect design. We don't wanna spend more money and, 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 and years later realize that we haven't amounted to anything. The new shelter concept is the navigation center, but go to San Francisco and really see what the bang for the buck is. What was the bang for the buck for Smart Solutions to Homelessness? Smart Solution to Homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. My name is Kate Arietta. I'm 70 years old. I have a modest home in Capitola, it's 800 square feet. My property taxes are $4,242 a year. 28% of that amount goes to bonds. My social security monthly payment is $730. I pay 48.3% of my Social Security money into property taxes. Let me say that again. I pay 48.3% of my monthly Social Security payments in property taxes. And 28% of those property taxes go to bonds. I would hope that affordable housing would not further my burden on my property taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome Good morning, back. everyone. Um, I'm Tom Bros. I'm a organic farmer in Watsonville and currently also a president of Santa Cruz County Farm Bureau and um, sat on the broad coalition of uh, uh, this bond measure. And I, I think uh, it's really important to point out that Agriculture is facing a uh, farm, uh, farm worker housing crisis and um, uh, amidst a labor shortage as well. And I think it's really important to recognize through the farm worker housing study that was just released um, in Monterey and Santa Cruz that um, 
we have an overcrowded situation among farm, worker, in, among farm workers and that 70% of the farm workers today are living amongst us in our community and it is really important that we have permanent affordable housing for our farm workers in the sense that we can have an agricultural industry that can thrive, that can you know, support our community here and so I'm really uh, hopeful that we can um, with the county also already prioritizing farm worker housing to continue working with everyone and see this bond uh, be put on the ballot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Joel DeValcourt. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, I personally cannot uh, afford to live in Santa Cruz uh, with my wife and my son, even though I actually work in the field of developing affordable housing. Um, I have been working for about seven years to support and create affordable homes in the greater Bay Area region. And right now is a really, really exciting time for affordable housing, despite what is happening at the national level. We have a lot of local governments, counties in particular, who are stepping up and really investing in their people and their economy and their environment. Um, and San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda counties all did it successfully in 2016. They raised um, a considerable amount of money for affordable housing and now it has done so much to invest and infuse capital into what is a, a really challenging um, federal disinvestment in housing. Um, and we can do it as locals, we can do it as a community, um, and I, br I, I believe very firmly that this will have an ex exceptional positive impact on, on Santa Cruz County uh, for, for residents, for people who are vulnerable, as well as families who are struggling to afford. So thank you very much. I, I look forward to your support for the bond. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Morning, members of the board, members of the community. My name is Matt Nathanson. I am the regional vice president for SEIU Local 521, and I'm a county employee here on my own time. Um, and I'm here to speak in favor of the motion before you to put this bond measure on the ballot before the voters. Um, affordable housing from the perspective of the members we represent who are county workers, city workers, nonprofit workers, school district workers, is critical is we you know we struggle with you at the bargaining table to fight for an affordable wage and then it all gets wiped out and more in the cost of housing more and more our members are living further and further away from their jobs many of them are county workers who actually need to be available during crisis situations you know if you think about the floods last year when you needed road workers coming in and the remarkable work people did they need to be close enough to be able to do that, child protective services workers, et cetera. Um, this will not, this, we know that this will not solve the whole problem. Affordable housing is going to take many different solutions, but this is an option available to you, and we need to start working on the solutions. Um, it's paired well with there's a state bond measure before us, Proposition 1 this year. I think this will help us leverage money from that, assuming that that passes. Um, and then it's really my last comment is after November, um, and these votes have happened, we wanna continue to work with the county on other solutions, um, including things like looking at issues like workforce housing. I think that's a way that the county can make us a unique contribution to developing more affordable housing in our community. So we look forward to this being on the ballot so that we can discuss it and formally take a position to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Erica Padilla Chavez, a native of Watsonville and the director of Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. And I'm here this morning um, to share with you the connection between housing and the behavioral health of our children in the Pajaro Valley. In our agency, we provide behavioral health or mental health services and substance abuse services to over 7,000 children and their families in the Pajaro Valley. As was previously mentioned, the housing conditions that many of our families are living in in, in South County are requiring families to share two to three bedroom house between a family of four to five families. Every individual should have the opportunity to live in a housing envir environment that provides them a sense of security and peace. It's a sanctuary. A home is a sanctuary. And for those of us in the mental health community, we have a mantra, a motto, that 
housing is first, that we can't address the mental health conditions of our children and our families without first ensuring that their housing needs are met. We don't have that access right now. By putting this on the ballot, you're providing an equitable opportunity for these children to live a very prosperous life. So I thank you for considering the many children and families that do need this opportunity so that they can live a prosperous life. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the outstanding work your organization does for the community. Good morning and welcome back. Okay, real quick. I do not believe that you can make housing more affordable by making it more expensive. Currently, we already pay 500% more in property taxes than they do in the state of Hawaii. If you add on top of that all the various bonds that we have, the average person moves every four or five years, so the average price is $900,000. That's $9,000 a, a year in property taxes with bonds. You're looking at $1,000 a month just to pay for taxes and bonds. The average house is 3,600, that's a thousand of it right there just to pay for more taxes. But, so I urge you guys, there are things that we can do that won't cost $140 million that can improve housing. The state has passed numerous laws considering the zoning. We right here can take responsibility for our own zoning. The state has passed laws, we can have multiple houses per parcel. We can have multiple ADUs, we can have junior ADUs, we can have kitchenettes all in a house. Look at the map up there. We live in one of the least dense counties in the entire state. I personally own three acres. I have seven neighbors that touch my property. Five of them are one acre or less. I go downstairs and I say, hey, I'd like to rezone my property or divide it up to the same size of my neighbors. Guess what they say? No. I say, hey, I'd like to have a couple ADUs. The state passed a law that says we can have multiple ADUs. They say, oh, that's interesting. No, that's too politically difficult to do. We don't want to do that. And they said, oh, or it can't pass a general plan. I spoke to the Sacramento, the California Department of Housing, and the people, Senator Wachowski, who passed the bill on the ADUs. They said, it doesn't co uh, constitute a change in the general plan. Heck, our even own representative, Senator Stone, voted for a law that got it out of committee that's going in front of the, the assembly now that would allow multiple ADUs per parcel. If our own Stone, who has a wonderful uh, approval rate around here, can support that. Why can't we? So let's get that discussion going as far as moving forward, Thank and you. that'll make that 140 million go a lot farther if we change the zoning. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, we'll see. Uh, I'm Nora Hockman. I'm with the Movement for Housing Justice, specifically the Campaign for Rent Control in the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, we have not taken a position on this bond measure. Many of us have very different thoughts about it. But I wanna say this on behalf of 20,000 renters in the City of Santa Cruz. None of this helps them a bit. They are dying on the vine. They cannot afford to live here. They are the people who provide a wide variety of services that you've heard about. If your board took a position to support the campaign for rent control in the city of Santa Cruz, 20,000 tenants would be cheering your action on behalf of stabilizing their housing. This is very long-term stuff. All of those people, they will be gone by the time any of this is realized. So thinking long term, that's great. But my daughter and her family, who already live in Merced, are not gonna benefit from any of this. I'll probably be 85 or 90 years old by the time any of it comes to pass. So I'm begging you, on behalf of those tenants, you should all be endorsing the campaign for rent control. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hockman. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, thank you. My name is Dori Rosinda. I'm here on behalf of Salud Para La Gente. Salud Para La Gente uh, supports the bond measure and um, serves about 30,000 uh, community members, mostly in the Pajaro Valley. And uh, we do that with a commitment to ensuring access to healthcare and improving and working towards a healthy community. And, and a very um, high contributor to poor health is housing. Um, at the Santa Cruz Community Ventures, who will speak behind me, uh, following me, 
um, has a survey that they did in Watsonville and found that our, our community spends, uh, two thirds of it spends um, over a third of their income on housing, which sounds like a lot, but I think when you consider in our community what that really means is they're spending more than a third on their housing in overcrowded and substandard conditions. It becomes something very significant and affects people's health. Um, in addition, uh, about 65% are about a month away from homelessness, one paycheck. Oh no, really? Just have another minute. <laughs> But I have more to say. Um, you have I, another minute to go. Okay, Please. great. I, I just want to put a, a, a picture to what it means to have health co uh, conditions that are a result of housing. We have families or children that come in um, with rat bites, uh, with asthma from uh, mold and mildew, um, pest infestations, and this is really the kind of substandard housing that many families are living in within Watsonville. And we support the bond measure both to create more affordable housing, new housing, and especially rehabilitation housing, which is an, an essential part. We also encourage that as it's implemented that there be um, local uh, jurisdiction-based committees uh, made up of community members to make sure that the implementation of it, um, assuming that it passes, is um, really focused on the equity of the community in which it's um, being built out. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for Salud's work. It's remarkable. Good morning, welcome back. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Chair and Board. My name is Maria Cadenas. I'm the Executive Director of Santa Cruz Community Ventures. We work to create compassionate and equitable local economies here in the Sa County of Santa Cruz. Uh, two years ago, we did a study about the affordability and access for housing, which uh, Dory from Salud just mentioned. The truth is that the affordability housing gap is real in the county. People are spending over 50% of their income into housing, eating away from their opportunity to save and actually create assets and move out of poverty of there or create economic mobility. Our interest in is asking you, the board, to support placing this bond measure on the ballot for November and to consider other housing possibilities that have more short-term impact to our communities, as well as taking an account, including the community's voices and decision makings on planning and design and dancing conversations, dense conversations around how development happens. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, uh, Laura Segura, Executive Director of Monarch Services. We've been in the community for 41 years, working with uh, victims of domestic violence, human trafficking, and sexual assault. Um, I am a Watsonville resident, I'm a taxpayer, and I'm also a homeowner, and I am happy to support this bond. Um, housing is a human right, and this bond will provide more housing, including funding for those who are facing homelessness. As funding gets rolled out, I really encourage that we're really intentional about the policies we develop to ensure that policies are based on equity. And um, a couple things, that developments don't displace families uh, that, and we're continuing to see that in, in the Watsonville community, um, that's also called racialized displacement. Um, that also we implement and take a really close look at local preference policies that are, that are put in place so that people who ha are living in our communities have access, first access and priority access to the affordable units. So I'm really looking forward to working with the committee um, and supporting this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. My name is Alina Harway and I come to you today wearing two hats. Um, the first is as a Santa Cruz County resident. I live just north of Scotts Valley in District 5. Um, when my husband and I purchased our home, we declared it our forever home. We simply love our community. And loving this community means taking seriously a shared commitment to helping our community thrive. Right now, I'm concerned. I'm worried about my friends and peers. I'm worried about families and hardworking people who are pushed to the brink of homelessness because of the cost of housing. I worry into the future about the fate of my young son and his generation and if they'll be able to stay here. I know my concerns are not exclusively mine. The other hat I wear today is that of Communications Director for NPH, the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. Recent NPH polling found that nine out of 10 Santa Cruz County residents have those same fears that I do. They're concerned about local workers, low-income residents, and disadvantaged families being able to find an affordable place to live. These concerns aren't someone else's problems. When we're concerned about the community, it's the responsibility of the community to find a solution, to come together to find that. 
The proposal in front of you today is that opportunity to address our problem by creating more affordable housing options and opportunities for Santa Cruz County families and hardworking individuals. NPH has been proud to work with the Exploratory Committee steered by Don Lane and Fred Keeley. We've attended stakeholder meetings, conducted research, and shared the technical expertise we've accrued by helping other local communities in Northern California pursue and pass similar policies. As an affordable housing professional, I can tell you that this measure is well modeled for success, feasibility, and that we work with nonprofit home builders who are more than ready to create affordable homes, but need local and state funds to bring those opportunities to our Santa Cruz County community. As a local resident, I can tell you that I live in a county filled with friends, family, and neighbors who are concerned about our housing crisis and want to take action to address it, but need your vote today to put this opportunity in front of them. I hope you will pass this resolution today and allow these opportunities to come before our community. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Good morning and welcome, thank you. Hi, good morning. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is Carmen Herrera Mansir. I'm a resident and homeowner in Watsonville, California. I'm also the executive director for El Pajaro Community Development Corporation. Um, in our organization, we promote equal access to economic opportunity and uh, by assisting entrepreneurs who create jobs and wealth in our community. However, these entrepreneurs often cannot afford to stay and live in our area here in Santa Cruz County or Watsonville. In fact, last year, one of our entrepreneurs went um, homeless while when she lost um, the lease to the home where she lived with her um, children. She had to go and put children in different houses of people that she knew until it took her months to find housing. Um, so for this reason, I'm here to support uh, the bond. And I uh, just also wanna request that in issuing and uh, doing the guidelines for that bond, we think about doing that, assuring that there's equitable um, community development lens in doing that and make sure that uh, we are also inclusive, fair, and that we give lo local preference uh, for housing access. So thanks very much for the opportunity and um, I also wanna uh, asked, um, I'm gonna use this opportunity to ask you to support our work that we do in terms of economic development and creating uh, jobs and businesses in this community. So I'm gonna leave this in here for you Thank to you. attend an event that we have Thank soon. you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Morning Chair, members of the board, Matt Huerta here, um, program manager, housing program manager with Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. I'm also a board member with Nonprofit Housing Association Northern California. You heard from Alina Hardway earlier, and um, it's just that's the kind of, of uh, representation that I think you're gonna hear a lot more of um, that you've already heard today, and um, it's just really absolutely critical that this move forward to the voters uh, under your leadership. Um, this is about trying to do um, the fair share uh, for this community, not only to, to honor the needs of local community here, but to share in, in the um, really critical uh, uh, issue that we have in affordable housing and housing overall across the entire region. And, um, you know, candidly, we're just, we're not gonna see very much, if all, at all, any affordable housing if this doesn't move forward um, because without subsidized uh, uh, grants and long-term interest loans that this will make possible, um, affordable housing doesn't get done. Um, that's absolutely critical to underwrite the rents and to also provide the assistance for down payments for moderate income home buyers in our community. So this is a critical resource. And um, again, the other piece too to remember is the $4 billion um, Housing Bond Act. It's pulling really well. It looks like it's gonna move forward at the state level. We will not see our, share, our fair share here in our region if um, leaders such as yourself don't move courageously to make sure that we have local matching sources. Thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Huerta. Good morning, Mayor Reed. Thank you for being here this morning. 
Thank you, Chair and Board. Um, you've heard a lot of really eloquent testimony this morning uh, on the need and the, the scope of the problem, but I want to go back for a second to something that uh, former Mayor Lane indicated. Uh, talking about the breadth of the coalition that we're looking at here that's getting behind this concept, it's one thing to have affordable housing and homeless advocates who are before you championing a solution, but when you've got business leaders from all across the county, uh, when you've got small businesses like we have in my city who realize that we have to do something about this, when you've got working professionals, when you've got parents, soccer moms, soccer dads who understand that it would be nice if there was a way that they were going to be able to spend time with their kids and their grandkids once they got older. And instead of moving with them to Oregon or to Texas or to New Mexico or Arizona or Nevada, if they can find a place for them to be here. So I think you've got a, a, a unique moment in time where we can mobilize the people necessary to ensure there's a majority, a two-thirds majority that'll pass this. Secondly, I think we all know this is public policy that's been done the right way. Um, the outreach that's gone into crafting this measure led by Fred Keeley and Don Lane, it's been done over years, not weeks. It's involved not handfuls of people, but hundreds of people. You've got a really well thought out solution, a rational response to a very critical problem. Third issue, even if some of you might have questions about the cost or some of the issues uh, in this bond, I think we can all agree just on a basic philosophical level, this is the most pressing issue that people in Santa Cruz County face today. And when a well-crafted solution comes forward, it just almost seems there's an obligation to put this directly before the voters and let the voters have their say. Uh, and the last thing I would say, you know, we are living in a time uh, when depending on what metric you use, there is greater prosperity in this country right now than there has ever been in the lifetimes of anybody in this room. At the same time, we are living in a time where there is unprecedented fear and uncertainty about our political climate and about whether government can work. Virtually the only thing that people on both sides of the political spectrum can agree on is that government is working for them, whoever them is. It's not looking out for themselves. Here's a solution that addresses the most Thank pressing you. problem that people have in a very thoughtful way. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thank you for those comments. Good morning, welcome, thank you for waiting. Good morning, board, and thank you for your time and attention. My name is Caitlin Brune, and I serve as CEO of the Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust. And I'm here to speak in favor of the bond. I think that each of you is aware that there's data that strongly indicates that improved housing and neighborhood environments could lead to significant reductions in the health disparities that we experience north to south county. I want to echo Mayor Reed in saying that this is a model approach to crafting a solution that spans the issue of homelessness and housing affordability for, for our community. I want to um, speak to my colleague, uh, Rebecca Garcia, city council member in Watsonville, saying that we have local solutions that have been demonstrated to um, address the problem effectively that are simply lacking for the resources needed to implement them. And I want to echo um, Tom Bro's organic farmer um, to indicate that there's a desperate housing affordability crisis facing our farm worker population, which is the key constituent served by my organization. And here we have a wonderful opportunity to put this before the voters and do the right thing in terms of creating better access to housing for um, low income, low wage workers, including farm workers and our healthcare workforce. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, and thank you for your work. Morning, welcome back. Uh, good morning, Chairman and Supervisors of the Board. Thank you uh, for being here and you're listening. If we can get the screen you had up on the board, uh, that would be really great, the one with uh, the info you had, uh, and I'll continue. Um, so, sorry, I get nervous. I'm sure everyone else does. But uh, it seems like what you're doing is you are adding a tax onto people's homes, and then they are paying for other people to have homes. And then uh, what that is is kind of like a reverse Robin Hood. You're taking from homeowners to make more homes, and then their rent prices are going to go up because they'll have to charge more to get the parcel taxes. And the caveat is if people cannot pay for their 
parcel taxes, and you've heard the other people speak, if they cannot pay for all these taxes on their homes, they run the threat of losing their homes. And um, affordable housing is a great conceptual idea, and I acknowledge you guys for tackling uh, this concept of how do we provide more housing for Santa Cruz and how do we provide more housing for people. But by using um, taxing of homeowners to buy property and create uh, rents for other um, homeowners, or renters, shall I say, the, the questions I have is where does the money go? Because then it would be like, is this going to the state? Is all the money going to more government funding? Is it going to whose pockets are go this going? And, and really what I'd like to put in place is how can we really empower the local citizens of Santa Cruz, California, like maybe make it easier for them to, um, to build on their own property. Because if they can build on their own property, they can provide more housing, if they can provide more housing, they can have more money in their pockets. If they have more money in their pockets, then be a greater contribution to this community here that we have is so dear. And the more it gets outsourced to people that aren't locals, the more we lose its authenticity. And um, lastly, I wanted to say on the summary, you have 21 for regional homeless needs. And I think you mean 21 million, Thank and you. that's a big difference. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Hi, good morning. Um, Paulina Moreno with Community Action Board. Um, our work at CAB focuses on working with uh, serving the most vulnerable and marginalized in our community. That is low-income families, immigrants, youth, the re-entry community, and the homeless, among others. Uh, every, two years among, every two years, CAB leads community poverty conversations to identify the greatest impacts of poverty in our county. Last year in 2017, the second top need identified by people living in Santa Cruz County was rent burden and housing insecurity, with jobs and higher wages uh, as the number one need. The community is hungry for solutions, and this affordable housing bond is one of those solutions. So we thank you for your work, and we strongly urge you to support it and place it in before, uh, before borders in November. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, commissioners. Um, Derek Tim, I'm a small business owner here in the county, and I have to say, uh, usually you won't have me up here uh, asking you to support more taxes, but in this case, this is a really uh, well thought through proposal, and one of the most pressing concerns as a small business owner is retaining our employees, and I've seen it time and time again, uh, small businesses, myself and other owners, losing employees to the cost of housing in our county. Um, we need solutions, and this is one part of a larger solution. Uh, hats off to Don Lane and Fred Keeley who have brought together a broad coalition to support this. Uh, I think they've scaled back from what was a more ambitious proposal. They've uh, reduced it by over $100 million to something that's more digestible, I think, to the voters in this county. Um, I think it behooves you as a uh, commission to put this on uh, the ballot so the voters can vote on it. And I think there's a lot of small business owners out there like myself, I'll tell you a story of an employee of mine who was able to successfully get into an affordable housing unit. She's been able to stay in this county unlike a lot of workers here. And if we can provide that kind of solution to our, our employees, my business can keep on surviving as can other businesses in our county. So, so please let the voters decide on this and thank you for your time, appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning Mr. Cancino, welcome back. Good morning, uh, Ray Cancino, CEO of Community Bridges. On behalf of the board, um, the coworkers that I work with, uh, the families we serve, and the 20,000 people we um, provide service to, we're in support of this measure. Uh, we've been in support of this measure for many reasons. Um, UCSC found the study, 70% of our community is rent burdened. Uh, we know we have the second um, uh, largest percentage of poverty in our community. HCAA um, did a uh, research study also and found two thirds of our employees are uh, using some sort of services in our community in order to maintain uh, their living standards here. The reality is it's impacting everybody. Uh, through this process, um, we've been a part of helping uh, craft this and we scaled it back. Uh, we talked to community members and we, the original uh, envisioned uh, number was a lot higher. Um, I look forward to spending the $120 uh, do, you know, dollars a year in addition to help support other community members, me and my wife, I shouldn't say just me, um, to help support to make sure that we have affordable housing for everybody, including um, nonprofit workers and those that we serve in our community. So uh, th thank you, hopefully, for your support. Thank you, Mr. Cancino. Welcome back, Mr. Willoughby. Uh, good morning. Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Uh, affordable housing requires three things. 
land, money, and political will, and today you can tackle two of those. You can move this on to the voters to provide a significant amount of money to solve this problem, and you can put the political will behind it. A unanimous vote today would be a good note for the community to no take notice of that you support this. So we hope that you will unanimously pass this on to the voters. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Lynn Warren, I'm a resident of Aptos, and I'm a former director of the State Department of Housing Community Development, and I also served as program director for the state's housing finance agency. I'd like to emphasize the critical nature of these housing funds would play in accessing these state funds. The funds are, these applications come from um, uh, a critical need that is supply for affordable housing for this county. Applications for these funds from around the state uh, are highly competitive and state administrators in Sacramento look to the funds that are supplied by local housing. I have seen a great number of housing programs around the state fail to reach their housing goals because of an absence of local money. In the fall, there will be two uh, affordable housing related bonds. And I can speak from experience that once those bonds, if they pass, the administrators in Sacramento will move very quickly to access those funds and look to local governments and their financing commitments to go forward. I really do encourage you to support this bond. It will make a big difference, I think, for the residents of this county. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for waiting. My name is Rosalinda Marino. I've been a resident of Santa Cruz County or City for the last 50 years. I am, this bond is not gonna help me, but it will help other generations. I am a renter, and I just received in the mail last week a $600 month raise in my apartment. And uh, I am 80 years old, and I definitely want everyone to vote for the rent control in the city of Santa Cruz so that it doesn't happen to them that I might become homeless as a disabled 80-year-old in Santa Cruz County. So I'm just urging everyone to vote for this, which is in the future. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I have called around. There is no list open for senior affordable housing right now in Santa Cruz. So I have to take it one day at a time, and hopefully something will come up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your story. Good morning, Mr. Kramer. Welcome back. Good morning. Good morning, Chair, friend, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Phil Kramer, Executive Director of the Homeless Services Center in Santa Cruz. Uh, we have 200 people living in emergency shelter and transitional housing on our campus in Santa Cruz, and we support another 260 people uh, throughout the county of Santa Cruz. HSC is an enthusiastic supporter of the housing bond, and hopefully uh, you are too, and we'll see it on the, on the ballot in November. Um, one of the biggest impediments and challenges we have, roadblocks we have to housing more individuals, veterans, uh, and families that are experiencing homelessness is a sufficient inventory and supply of affordable housing. So that's one piece of the bond that I think will be a big help uh, and help us house more people that find themselves in the crisis of homelessness. Another piece, uh, the 15% uh, part of the bond that will go towards uh, homeless services, uh, such as more shelter and transitional housing. Uh, we're also really excited about that. We know that shelter as a pathway to housing works. Last year, we helped house over 249 people. So we know that shelter as a pathway to housing works. So we're really excited about that. And hopefully we'll be able to apply that funding to new infrastructure developments, shelter, and transitional housing programs uh, in the coming years. So thanks so much for everything that you do and, uh, and look forward to your support. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Um, my name is Candace Elliott, and I wear a lot of different hats in this community. I'm the human resources manager for the Glass Jar Restaurant Group, and we have 150 staff that work in Santa Cruz and Capitola, and they live in every district in the county. And I'm also a member of the Alliance of Women Entrepreneurs and a board member for the Santa Cruz Downtown Association, where we're all focused on creating a thriving downtown space, and housing is a major part of that. Uh, until recently, I was the president of the board of directors at Pajaro Valley Loaves and Fishes, which serves Watsonville with nutritious food. Um, 
I'm a fifth generation Californian and my mom and my sister live here in Santa Cruz. And my great grandmother, Ruth Noren, used to come here on vacation from Fresno like years and years and years ago. Um, and I'm a ceramic artist and I work with locally sourced materials. I've been a part of this coalition for the past nine months and I'm very excited that we've come to this point. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to put this measure before the voters so that they can decide what's best for this community. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Hello, uh, my name is Evan Siroki, I'm with Santa Cruz UMB, and we're here to support uh, the affordable housing bond, uh, and uh, just further uh, tax reform and uh, bonds uh, of this sort, because uh, you know, while we support housing creation uh, of market rate, we realize that the market rate housing alone may not uh, impact the lowest income uh, of our population. And so, but furthermore, we do uh, also echo some uh, concerns here and advocate that you make these affordable housing funds go further by advancing some other things like uh, upzoning and allowing for uh, more, uh, you know, density bonuses and, you know, more opportunities to be more efficient with the land and also streamlining the permitting and also the fee structure so that you aren't charging affordable housing especially. Uh, perhaps as much fees and making it just easy to get through a process and not taking a very long time. And so, thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, Fred and Don and I have had parallel careers. Uh, I went to uh, Sister High School from where Fred went. I went to Homestead High School. I think Fred and I overlapped for uh, a little bit in, at De Anza College in 1972. Uh, then I went to UC Santa Barbara. I know Don went to UC Santa Cruz. Uh, if I recall correctly, they studied politics and I studied economics. Um, you can't make housing more affordable by putting a tax on housing. That's the fundamental problem with this proposal. It, it's not gonna work. And uh, when I say it's not gonna work, I mean that the negative consequences will outweigh the benefits uh, over time. The, the chart over there says 1,000 units could be built over like 30 or 40 years. Um, and if like 2.75 people live in each one of these units, that's about 2,800 people. Uh, that's about 1% of the current population of Santa Cruz County. So I get the proposal is to tax everyone in the county for 30 or 40 years to help 1% to somewhat help them. You're not going to fully help them. I, I think this is a drop in the bucket. Um, and I think that the lack of affordable housing around here is largely a self-inflicted wound. It's because local jurisdictions have been pursuing no growth or low growth policies for more than 40 years here. The barriers to development have been erected so high. Now maybe it's improving now, for the county at least. Um, but the, the backlog of that 40 years worth of, uh, of negative development policies is what has caused this problem largely. Uh, state matching funds, the proposal on the ballot in November, I think is 3.1 billion. There's, there's another billion for veterans or something, 3.1 billion. Our share of that would only be $21 million. Thank you. This is far outside of th what we need for state matching funds. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Chair, rest of the Supervisors. Uh, my name is Robert Singleton. I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. We represent around the 80, lar 80 or so largest employers in the county. Um, every year we poll our members about the issues that are most important to them and the issues that are affecting their business. And every year that I've been at the Business Council, which is six years now, housing has been by far and away the number one issue. Uh, just cutting right down to it, uh, because of the high cost of housing, uh, it's really hard to attract and retain talented employees. Um, it's really hard to maintain uh, service workers um, here in Santa Cruz County to support our industries that are, you know, agriculture and, and hospitality are our two biggest industries. So we need to do something to address the housing affordability crisis. And while this is a tax on housing, it's a progressive tax that would go towards those, the larger houses to help fund those who are most in need. And the business community recognizes that that's important. Um, and that's why we're supporting these kinds of issues, and that's why we've been involved in the planning of this ballot initiative since the beginning with Fred and Don. And so just want to say we urge you to put this on the ballot. Um, thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Mr. Singleton. Good morning, welcome, I appreciate your waiting. Good morning, uh, my name is Alex Weske. I'm uh, a program manager with Hope Services in Santa Cruz. We support individuals with developmental disabilities. Uh, there are approximately 1,000 adults with developmental disabilities in this county, uh, approximately 600 of which still live in their family homes. This is often not by choice. Um, affordable housing is a major barrier to these people leading uh, happy and, uh, and fulfilling lives. Uh, it's also a barrier to us uh, finding and maintaining a team of uh, direct service professionals that can afford to live in this county. Um, so I just want to say that we are in support of this, uh, this uh, bond. Thank you. Thank you for your work. And we did receive a letter from your executive director in support as well. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Foster. Welcome back. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the, of the board. Um, I'm David Foster, Executive Director with Habitat for Humanity, Monterey Boar, Bay. I'd like to be on record in support of the, uh, on behalf of my board, uh, in support of the bond measure. Um, Habitat does its part in, uh, its small part in building affordable homes here in the county using local volunteers. We're currently building home ownership homes in Live Oak with uh, support from the county. And our next two homes will be uh, reserved for a family with a mobility disability and a veteran's family. Uh, since the loss of the redevelopment agency in 2011, the availability of local housing funds has plummeted. Affordable housing programs simply cannot survive without the local funding uh, sources needed to be competitive for state, federal, and uh, tax credit housing funds. Um, please, let's make this a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work, Mr. Foster. Good morning. Thank morning. you for waiting. Uh, good morning, Mike Paisano, Live Oak. Uh, I've been very lucky to be part of uh, Measure O unit up on campus and now Measure J in Live Oak, and I urge and I vote to help retain workers local and also keep our families local. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, welcome back, Ms. Garrett. Marilyn Garrett, I want you to visualize this cartoon. I'm gonna get you a copy of it. There's a, um, um, a man in like uh, doctor's garb, and he has his clipboard. He says, are you feeling sad and depressed? You may be suffering from capitalism. Sis, uh, symptoms include homelessness, unemployment, hunger, anxiety, fear. We're talking about a system problem of capitalism that's based upon greed. And I appreciate Bruce Holloway's comments on economics. Here's some other economics of this. Over half of our tax dollars go to the military budget, and the Congress just approved $717 billion for more military money. I heard someone else say we suffer from a lack of local funds. These funds are being siphoned out of this community and other communities to go to dangerous, inappropriate priorities for profit for the military and big business and big developers. This does not solve the problem. It's a system problem, and I have reported to this board before, and I'll say this again, I saw real affordable housing when I visited the former Soviet Union, relatives of mine, in 1966, after the war, they had my Mother's cousin paid about 5% of her income for rent. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back, Mr. Darling. Thanks morning. for waiting. Darrell Darling, retired pastor, um, currently participating in a congregation, Methodist congregation, that's seriously considering uh, building uh, affordable housing on a um, uh, plot here in Santa Cruz, or in uh, Live Oak area. One of uh, several congregations who are also looking at uh, means by which we can build on uh, church, church property. 
I strongly encourage uh, your support of this um, measure. I also, the bond measure, I also uh, appreciate your putting it before the community for a citizen's vote, and I encourage uh, other congregations to consider whatever means by which we can uh, encourage, enhance the living conditions of people in our community, uh, including the possibility of tiny, home, tiny houses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else like to address us? Ms. Barr, welcome back. Thank you Good very morning. much. Jane Barr, uh, Eden Housing. I urge your unanimous support for this housing bond. Eden has approximately 1,300 families on our wait list of the seven rental apartment complexes we own in Santa Cruz County. Despite the fact that these wait lists have been closed on all but one of the properties since 2014 and 2015. Nevertheless, we receive inquiries daily. Um, the staff estimate of 987 affordable rental units, including ADUs, will, be, will not be hard to meet in a fairly short period of time. During the exploratory phase of the bond, a pipeline projection was put together which estimated that 1,400 units of only new affordable rental housing could be developed over 10 years. Um, our wait list alone could fill the proposed units funded by this bond one and a half times. Uh, hopefully, uh, the dollars we stretch to build much more housing than this estimate. Each drop in the bucket helps and more uh, supply should help slow down rent increases. Finally, the importance of this local bond cannot be underestimated. Anticipating approval of the state housing bond, Santa Cruz County will be best positioned to compete for the state funds if jurisdictions have local funds to commit as a local match. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, Mr. Keeley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members, thank you very much. My name is Fred Keeley, a resident of Santa Cruz County and the city. I wanted to clarify one issue, the issue of seniors and the affordability of the property tax system. Uh, you probably know that this bond does not need to have a specific provision uh, exempting low-income seniors and so on. There is a state statute which allows seniors at a certain low income level to defer their property taxes uh, and it automatically applies to any tax that is uh, adopted by the voters, uh, property tax based. So I wanted to say, people have said, gee, this doesn't have it in it. It doesn't need to be in it because the state law covers any tax related to property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keeley. Does anybody else like to address us? Okay, seeing none, we'll, we'll bring it back to the board for consideration and action. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'd like to thank, uh, especially Fred Keeley, Don Lane, uh, Affordable Housing Now, now Melanie Serino. I, I know that she put a lot of work into this in this last month to make it all fit uh, for those uh, to put in the, this measure together. I know it's taken many months and there's been many uh, representatives here and I, I haven't seen this rep reminds me of what we did with Measure D in the transportation sector when we got a real cons uh, a conglomerate of uh, folks together to see how we can address the housing needs of this, uh, of this county. And the affordable housing need here in this region, in this county, is not unlike any, every other county in California and, and much of the United States as well. And I, I think we should let the voters decide uh, if they want to invest more in affordable housing. I do appreciate that the manor before us is $140 million, uh, which strikes a balance uh, was, uh, for being an overburdensome uh, challenge to the property owners today. I mean, it was first thought to be $250 million. That would have been a, a real, um, real hurdle for people, to, for some people to get over. But um, I think if this passes in November, I, I would like to see something in an implementing ordinance uh, from the CO that addresses how we can, uh, in our planning department, which has been overburdened with uh, various challenges and, uh, and, and uh, th that it has to put forth before us. But I would like to see that in terms of the permitting process that this give special attention. I mean, it's one thing to approve this, but historically, our planning department, I don't think it's been in recent years, 
but it hasn't been, you know, on uh, put it in the high gear to get something done as far as housing goes. If we're going to do this and we're going to address building affordable housing, I would like to see uh, somehow we uh, develop in the planning department a format for what is needed to uh, quantify, qualify for this affordable housing measure. And so when somebody comes in to the planning department, they can get some quick attention, predictable attention to get something done. Uh, in, in essence, I don't want to see these uh, estimated 1,041 units take 20 years to build. I'd like to see if we're going to do this, let's see, a, let's get a program and a procedure in the planning department so we can move forward as quickly as possible. I don't know what that is, and it could be very complicated. But I think if we're really serious about this, uh, we don't have a history of building a lot of units per year in, in the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County. I want to make sure that we focus on getting the job done, that what the people, should they approve this, say they want to do, that we're going to build more affordable housing in the shortest amount of time possible. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Caput? Well, we're voting on uh, putting it on the ballot, letting people vote on uh, whether or not they want this uh, tax. And uh, I will, uh, I'll move for approval. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, su su there is not a motion yet, but uh, Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah, uh, I'm obviously supportive, and I appreciate everyone taking the time to come out today. Um, I, in order to get discussion started, I'll move approval of the recommended action. Motion from Coonerty? So we, we, and, a, and a second from uh, McPherson. We'll just continue conversations. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, do you have additional information to add? No, I already came back. Okay, to Supervisor Le uh, Leopold. It's hard to keep track what's, uh, <laughs> where the emotions are being made. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for coming down here today to talk with us. Uh, I appreciate all the work that has been done in the community uh, to put something together that has broad support. Um, it's very clear that uh, affordable housing is at a crisis level here in Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, we have to do, uh, we have to look at all sorts of creative ways. This board has worked to make things easier uh, for building things like ADUs. We have thought about our development future differently um, and not all be single family homes. Uh, and we need resources to be able to do that. Um, the, the state law sets a very high bar uh, to pass measures, tax measures. Um, and it's important to be able to go out to the public and ask what they want to invest in. Uh, and uh, through that process, we, we can um, b be fairly sure uh, that we're doing what the public wants. And so I hear people uh, complain sometimes about taxes, but those were all passed by the people, most of them on a, at a two-thirds uh, level. Uh, this has a high bar to pass, um, and it will require lots of work by everybody here in this room and uh, lots of other people in the community in order to be successful. But I believe that this uh, coalition is strong and effective and uh, reaches out into the community that it can be successful. I believe it's important to ask people if, they, if, if, if they've identified affordable housing as a number one issue that we provide an opportunity for people to weigh in and uh, provide resources to help uh, address the issue. So I support the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. I'd just like to also add uh, my thanks, not just to Mr. Lane and Mr. Keeley, but the work internally of staff that happened behind the scenes, Ms. Serrano, Ms. Coburn, Ms. McRae, Mr. Palacios. There are a lot of county staff that worked with all the cities on uh, trying to put something together that could come before us today that would be uh, legal and also actionable. So I appreciate the work on that. Um, and to me, I think that the question that's really before the board and before the community at large is when will we fundamentally turn the page on uh, the impacts of affordability so that the next generation does not face what this current generation faces? And when will we also turn the page on the immediate impacts of affordability uh, on homelessness, on working families, on seniors, on veterans, on teachers, on public safety, so that they too can have relief uh, from impacts that are forcing people to make very difficult decisions within our community. 
And to the argument that this may take a while to provide some relief, uh, I would say that it's incumbent upon policymakers to make decisions so that future generations don't face the challenges that we face today. Um, it'd be like saying that I'm not gonna eat vegetables today because I might, it's only gonna impact heart disease in 20 years. I think that you eat vegetables today for a lot of reasons. And you make long-term investments in not just a community, but in yourself. And our board and those that have been involved in this, brought together, by the way, a coalition of people who have not just historically not been together, but haven't been together on this issue. That's very telling. The people that have come before this board over the last two years to advocate for improved housing access, especially affordable housing access, have historically not been at the table and in fact been against housing expansion. If that isn't a clue to the greater community and the state at large that we're at beyond a tipping point on this, I don't know what is. And one element that helps address it is financing. And I do believe that what's before us today can help turn that page for those future generations, so I'm supportive of it and I appreciate the work of the community on this. We have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. <laughs> We're gonna take a, the board will take a very brief 10 minute break. We'll come back at 11.35 for our next item, give an opportunity to clear the room and also take a brief break. So 10 minutes. <laughs>
us that would be for park uh, capital improvements. Uh, it's important to note that the critical unmet needs that were identified by the department heads align perfectly with the strategic plan which the board adopted on June 26. They uh, fit in perfectly with the goals that were set at that time. So let's talk about the ongoing uh, operational needs, they're divided into three main categories. The first two uh, regard, are regarding mainly our uh, homeless population. Um, the Focus Deterrence Initiative uh, offers uh, programming that would pair public safety personnel, deputy sheriffs with behavioral health personnel to form uh, small teams that would go out and um, offer services to that small subset of the population that is resistant uh, to receiving treatment and services. Some of these individuals are um, resistant to services and engaging in criminal conduct. Um, this program uh, would be uh, something, is something that the sheriff and um, our health services agency have both talked about during budget hearings and they are here in the audience uh, to talk uh, further about that during public comments. In addition, uh, we want to fund the operational costs of a year-round 24-hour uh, homeless navigation center, one in Santa Cruz and one in the city of Watsonville. Right now, we offer uh, emergency shelter during the winter um, but we don't offer very much uh, in terms of uh, day services and we only, and we close down the winter shelter uh, during the summer. This navigation center would offer year round, 365 a, a days, uh, 24 hour services in both Watsonville and Santa Cruz. It would house, uh, provide services to about 40 adults in Watsonville and about 150 in the city of Santa Cruz. And then we have needs to um, maintain our parks uh, and provide more recreational activities, both for youth and seniors. And so this proposal would also provide new staffing to our parks department, both to maintain our parks and to offer uh, new um, recreation services. The other main category of needs that we are presenting to you today involve uh, parks and critical capital improvement projects. This is a, a list of the parks in which there we have plans, but we do not have funding. Uh, let me just highlight a few. Chanticleer Park, which would include uh, Leo's Haven, uh, which would be the county's first all-inclusive playground for children of all abilities. <laughs> And this will include uh, numerous accessible structures and features. Uh, there's been over $2 million raised privately for this project, and now the county needs to do its part and meet, uh, match those uh, funds to help make this park a reality. Uh, Simpkins Swim Center is another um, need. This is a deferred maintenance issue where the aging pool infrastructure, including pumps, heaters, and the deck need to be replaced. Um, there's also the opportunity to provide lighting at the pool, which would allow uh, nighttime use of the pool. Uh, that would be a very um, important project for us. And then you can see that the Felton Nature Park is um, also uh, something that's planned in conjunction with the Felton Library. Uh, it would provide an outdoor learning space for environmental literacy programming, interactive nature discovery zones, and an interpretive nature loop trail. Um, there has been grant funding secured for this project, but we need to find the county match. And then there's also funding for an Aptos Village, improvements at the Aptos Village Park, and for a possible new park in South County as well. So uh, the challenge before the board is how do we find the funds that are needed to fund these critical unmet needs um, that also align with the goals set by the board in our strategic plan? So we looked at two uh, main options. One is a sales tax or transactions and use tax, and the other is the hotel tax, or also called the transient occupancy tax. Uh, the sales tax uh, currently in Capitola and Scotts Valley is at 9%. In Watsonville and Santa Cruz, it's 9.25%. And the unincorporated area of the county is 8.5%. So we now have uh, the lowest uh, sales tax in the county. 
uh, a quarter cent sales tax would bring in $2.8 million, a half cent would bring in $5.7 million, and this would be in the unincorporated area. Uh, the hotel tax or the transient occupancy tax is currently at 11% in Capitola, Santa Cruz, Watsonville, and the county. Uh, Scottsville is at 10%. It was last raised in 2012. I know that there are proposals uh, to increase this, the hotel tax in Scotts Valley and um, Capitola, and I believe there will be one in Watsonville as well. This would bring in a 1% increase, and in the, the hotel tax would bring in about $762,000. So uh, staff is recommending, after reviewing these options and the critical and met needs that we have before you, uh, to place a half cent transactions and use tax or sales tax on the November 6th ballot. This would be a tax in the unincorporated area only, uh, even though the entire uh, voters in the entire county would vote on it uh, because they are, uh, would also benefit from the tax. It would be for a 12-year period and would be subject to annual audits and independent citizens oversight. Um, the process would be that if the board chooses today to place it on the ballot, it would go in the ballot in November. If it's approved, it would be in effect probably in the last quarter of this fiscal year, so March through June. So we would get about a quarter of the proceeds if we put in a half cent. So that would be about $1.4 million in this fiscal year, 2018-19. So we would have next year, in 1920, you would have the full $5.7 million. This year, you'd have only $1.4 million. Here's how we would propose that the budget, the board uh, budgeted if it is approved by the voters. We, we would recommend that about a little more than $400,000 be used for the ongoing operating costs of the focused deterrence initiative. This is where the sheriff deputies and the behavioral health would offer services uh, for those uh, individuals who are resistant to enter into treatment. And, uh, and then we'd also fund the homeless navigation centers, both in Watsonville and in Santa Cruz. And then we'd also fund the parks uh, maintenance workers and uh, recreation staff. So that would be for them partial year funding for these programs. And then we would recommend trying to find the funds to, to fund all of these projects, which total $4.3 million. Uh, we think there's a way to do it. We've come up with it. Um, here's this, the, the recommendation we will be making to the board if the sales tax is approved. We would recommend using a million dollars of the sales tax in this year, uh, Prop 68 funds, which are state funds of half a million dollars. Uh, we believe there's going to be about a million dollars in budget savings from this um, last fiscal year. And we also were notified that we are going to be reimbursed for SB90 man mandate money, and we propose using about $1.9 million of that. So the combination of those four sources of funding would allow us to fund uh, all of these projects, every one of them, which would be a great benefit to the community. Um, so in conclusion, that's our recommendation, and um, that concludes my staff report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Caput? You bet. Uh, just to, uh, for the sake of uh, transparency, uh, um, the, the tax we're talking about is a 12-year tax? That is correct. Okay, it's not a 30-year tax, it's a 12-year okay. tax. Uh, 50 cents, uh, 50 percent plus one vote to pass it. That is correct. Okay, to assure that it's going to what we're voting for, uh, putting it on the ballot, I mean, that that's separate, but uh, people voting for it, uh, uh, how can they be assured that it's gonna go to what we intend it to go to? Well, we've put on a resolution uh, which the board, on today's agenda to accompany placing the measure on the ballot, which would set out these budget priorities for the board. And so you would be on record uh, approving these uh, budget priorities. Okay. And then I'm going to just read uh, South County Parks to provide matching funds uh, to unlock other resources. And I'll skip over a little bit to increase park safety, uh, deferred maintenance, and establish new or expanded park facilities, that means we could actually purchase land and add acreage to South County Park. That is correct. Right, I, I like the wording on that. And uh, just uh, 
<clears throat> I'll make a quick commentary, but I'm ready to vote on this. Um, you know, it's a sad commentary uh, on society today when you drive around and you look at what we used to use uh, schools for uh, parks and rec, our, our kids just going down there to the school to shoot baskets or to play catch or to kick the soccer ball around. Uh, if you look around, there are fences that have gone up. I've noticed uh, schools, a lot of schools are starting to look like prisons. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a sad commentary, something bad happens somewhere else. And uh, I, I really hate to see that. And uh, I've been uh, arguing that at least on weekends, uh, gates should be unlocked. People should be able to use those schools uh, for recreation. And uh, uh, the schools are not doing that. A lot of, a lot of them, they're locked up 24-7 uh, or whatever on weekends. And uh, so what I'm getting at is I, I don't want us to, if we're going to expand facilities and we're going to actually do maintenance, I don't want to see walls go up all around the facility and locking them out. I want to see access, people able, you know, able to go down there. Um, uh, so I, it, I mean, walls do not solve problems. Uh, they just defer problems and they, uh, they put them off somewhere else. So anyway, I just want to make sure that uh, our parks are accessible and I would like to see schools making their land accessible for people to use also their playgrounds for the kids that we see here that they're able to go down there and use them. Taxpayers are paying for all this and to have them locked out uh, during uh, reasonable hours uh, is not fair to the taxpayer. They're paying for it, they should have access to it, their kids and family should have access to it also. And uh, let's see, District 4, uh, that's basically it, so thank you. Thank you, a brief question from uh, Supervisor Leopold. I know we want to get to the uh, community as well. Yeah. Yes, uh, first. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask, <coughs> well, uh, uh, although this will be a tax that's only charged in the unincorporated area, the services that are going to be provided here are really countywide. The focus deterrent uh, uh, initiative is really to, to work with all of our incorporated <coughs> cities as well. Um, the Simpkins Swim Center is obviously a regional park facility. Uh, the Leo's Haven is, is going to be the only all accessible park uh, for um, uh, uh, handicapped children throughout all Santa Cruz County. So this, so everybody's going to get a chance to, to vote on this, but everybody will also get a chance to benefit from this. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, now is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on this item. Please feel free to step forward. Can I get a sense of how many people are interested in addressing us on this item, just to know how long testimony will be? Okay, we'll offer three minutes for each person. Thank you. Ms. Roberts, yes. Three minutes, I know. You don't have to take it all. I, I, this is true. Watch out. You want to come? Okay. I actually wrote something down today because it's a very wonderful celebratory day for our team. Um, my name is Mariah Roberts, director of Chanticleer Park Neighbors y Vecinos. See? Si. <laughs> and I'm here to say thank you to you for showing your commitment to the private public partnership that is Leo's Haven at Chanticleer Park. Thank you for prioritizing parks in your funding decisions and working with us to care for these spaces that we all hold dear. Through these years of work, you have shown us that a partnership with the County of Santa Cruz is not only possible, it can lead to something greater than its parts. Prioritizing healthy public spaces opens a free and accessible path for all of us to take charge of our own health, to find community, to connect with nature, and to strengthen our families. Yeah, yeah, he want, hang on, we have a comment. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> What's your name? My name is Sergio. Do you and like I am five years old. Anything else about the park? And I want the park here. All right. All right. Back to the boring, the boring comment. Um, 
Leo's Haven at Chanticleer Park has supporters from every district in this county from service clubs, chambers of commerce, community groups, businesses, medical providers, educators, I cannot think each of, thank each of them enough. Today, I really wanna give a shout out, however, to the El Patio de Mi Casa bilingual family support group from Live Oak Community Resources. For years since we first organized, these families have met every week out at the undeveloped park site, no bathroom. <laughs> Um, <laughs> led by their teacher, Yolanda Provost de Fuentes, who I want to grow up and become. She is here. Um, <clears throat> they have raised their children, planting and harvesting in the interim community gardens. They have found health, community, and support from each other under a, that giant, beautiful live oak. Whenever I'm weary of this fundraising and all of the hoops we all jump through, I go join the families in the park. I'm filled back up with nature. I'm nourished by the food from their harvest. I'm soothed by conversation, Yolanda's guitar, and the sound of kids playing. I hope you'll join me in thanking them today for exemplifying what a public spy space can offer. So I want to say thank you to the El Patio families. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for seeing that value and for following through on our shared commitment to build Leo's Haven at Chanticleer Park. Thank you. Thank you. Hola. Mi nombre es Inés Cartagena. Este estamos ya por varios años esperando el parque y sé que nos falta un poquito y esperamos su apoyo y estamos aquí porque este parque es especial todos tenemos un conocido eh, con necesidad con discapacidad o en, en nuestros vecindarios y gracias y por eso estamos aquí Okay. Do you need interpretation or yes. you understood? <laughs> I, 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 we may have had staff here that was here earlier, but they had no. <laughs> okay, well, mainly, what did you say? No, <laughs> I know what she said. That is, uh, it's very important to have a park in the community. We are the community. These children are going to be for many years there. And park is fun, is family, is communities, is diversity. It's everything, and the children is our future. You know, I'm 76 years old. I'm committed to do the work for them, because they're going to be here for a long time, and I hope that all of you do the same. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mariah, and thank you and all the mothers here. You can raise, and we use the park every week, and we have a beautiful garden. If you need care, go there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your work, Yolanda. Yolanda. My pleasure. Hola. Yeah. Hola. Yo quiero un parque para mí. <laughs> so, soy madre de, del patio de mi casa y considero que ese parque es muy importante para nuestros hijos. Pues queremos que crezcan libres, sanos, apasionados emocionalmente, sanos emocionalmente y empoderados para enfrentar los retos de la vida moderna. ¿Y qué más con este parque? No? Gracias por el apoyo. Gracias por lo que están haciendo para nosotros. Buen día. I'm going to do a better job now because before I didn't interpret. I <laughs> she said that she wants empowering the children and she goes to the garden because it's a place to Grow the children in a safe place. Okay. So okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Good job, you guys. Bye. Bye. Uh, thank you for your patience for being here so long. <laughs> Good morning, members of the board. My name is Will Forrest. I am a resident of the city of Santa Cruz, an employee of the county of Santa Cruz, and uh, the president of the Santa Cruz County Employees Chapter of SEIU. And nowhere near as charming or entertaining or organized as the families who just spoke. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I wanna say is anytime you're thinking about proposing a tax, there's Naturally, there's some resistance and there's, there's some concern potentially on your part that it might fail, that it might look bad and so on. 
And so I cannot, um, b because there is no ballot proposition as yet, the SEIU has not taken a position on it. Um, and so I can't speak as to that. But what I can tell you is that I have spoken with um, some of our members and our leaders and that we're enthusiastic about the prospect of this um, proposition being approved by your board so that it can go to the people of the county to make an informed decision. And um, I think any time that you are proposing something where you're putting it out to the voters to say, hey, do you want to spend money on this thing? Then the, vo the voters are getting to make the final choice. And so um, I, I, we fully support that. And um, I know that there are not very many ways in which the county has the ready ability to raise money and, and uh, the, the analysis by the CAO's or by staff um, shows that this is one of the few ways that you can go ahead and do that. And the purposes for which it is targeted, um, in particular um, the combination of health services, cooperation with law enforcement to um, reduce both kinds of issues we think is um, an extraordinarily good choice. So I wanna urge you all to vote yes on this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for waiting, Sheriff Hart. Good afternoon, I think, yeah, afternoon now. Uh, Chair Friend, Board of Supervisors, Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner, and I, I'm here just to express my support of the board to adopt this resolution to place the half cent sales tax on the November ballot. I talked to you a little bit at our budget hearing about the focused initiative, uh, focused deterrence initiative, and the, uh, uh, something I didn't say is that in my 30 years in law enforcement, I have never seen uh, the level of mental health calls and substance use disorder calls that our patrol staff receives every single day. We're responding over 10 times a day to people who are in serious mental health crisis, and that's just in the unincorporated area of the county. I'm sure the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville are experiencing similar numbers. And that's placing a tremendous uh, burden on our, our patrol staff, and, and all they're able to do is really place a Band-Aid on that call in that moment. And what this program would do, would it would allow us to partner sheriff's deputies with mental health professionals to work with the district attorney, the public defender, the courts, the probation department, to uh, focus on people who are causing harm in our community who won't accept and don't want help. And so using resources that, that we have access to, particularly the county jail, uh, along with other resources, uh, I feel like we can uh, convince these people that getting help, getting off the street, and, and stop causing harm in our community, uh, in our open spaces, our parks, our beaches, and our business districts, uh, it, it will do nothing but help our community. Um, in the fifth district, I think the most, the most picturesque park in this county is the Covered Bridge Park in the fifth district. And uh, that park is tremendously underutilized because of the number of people who are drinking and doing drugs and acting out. And you just don't see that many families in that park the way they, they should be using it. And unless I place a deputy there during the day hours, it just doesn't get used. And so I think having a team like this that could really focus on those people uh, for some long-term solutions will have tremendous benefit to the county. So. Uh, thank you for your time, and I encourage you to, to, to vote uh, yes on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership, Sheriff Hart, on that issue. Good afternoon. Thank you for waiting. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Karen Gosling, and as a citizen of Santa Cruz County, I'm uh, extremely enthused by this measure. As it's very exciting to see the energy going to something that is, is so critically important. I'm also here um, as part of Santa Cruz Sunrise Rotary Club, and we, along with many other Rotary Clubs, have been uh, very big supporters of Leo's Haven. Um, and I'm, I'm here with the, the crew that was with us behind us to really um, support this measure to make sure we get this park built. Uh, as a, as a healthcare professional and a rehabilitation therapist, I know the, the essential part of pay, play has for children's development and the consequences of not having that. And this park is really gonna go a long way to ensuring the continued development for all of our children. And, um, and we have to have it soon. Uh, as part of Santa Cruz Sunrise Rotary, we've been involved in many um, 
public fundraisers or private fundraisers to help put money towards this. And we have our final one coming up at the end of September. It's uh, John and Ken's most excellent adventure. And we have over 75 people who are training and raising money for this because they really believe in, in this park. And um, we're hoping that this could be the final push um, to get that groundbreaking done on October 13th. So um, as a Rotary member, as a healthcare professional, and as a citizen of this uh, community, I want to thank all of you so much for your continued support um, of the parks and especially Leo's Haven and thank you for your creativity in finding ways to make this happen. Thank you. And thank you, Karen, for the leadership, your leadership and the leadership of Sunrise Rotary for the project. I know that you've already raised a lot of funds and to hear another uh, one scheduled, hopefully will be the last one, uh, uh, is, is great. So thank you for your leadership. You're welcome, thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Corwin. Welcome. Good afternoon, um, I'm Terry Corwin. Some of you might remember me from my previous career as a CEO and president of Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. Um, I'm enjoying retirement now over a year, but I haven't lost my passion for this community, its parks, and its environment. Um, my kids live here, I have grandkids here, and I'm currently serving as treasurer of Santa Cruz Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks, there, I'm new. Um, despite my best efforts and those of some others over the last 10 years, and much to my chagrin, Santa Cruz County still does not have sufficient dedicated funding to steward its parks and open spaces. Our current County Parks Department, ably led by G Director Gaffney, remains at risk of drastic cuts in the next inevitable recession. We all remember when the last recession hit and the Parks Department was radically cut and rolled under public works. Because of this lack of sufficient dedicated funding, Santa Cruz County does not have a strong public agency such as an open space district or a stably funded Parks Department that can leverage and partner with nonprofits such as the Land Trust and or Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks or others. Nonprofits working in conservation and recreation in Santa Cruz County are at a disadvantage to their Bay Area brethren when it comes to competing for federal and state funds that require local matching funds. Thank goodness for our local philanthropic community that partially fills that void. I was honored to serve on the County Park Strategic Planning Working Group. I helped to facilitate at all five of the community meetings that were convened to receive input on priorities. The community has spoken through the strategic planning process and they love their parks and they wanna see it stick around. The ballot measure before you presents an opportunity to provide some funding. It does not solve the problem of dedicated funding, but it sure is a good start and I applaud you for considering it. I plan on, if it passes, um, if you pass it, and working hard to make it pass with the voters. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Ms. Corwin. Good morning, Ms. Hall, welcome back. Good morning, Chair Friend, Honorable Board of Supervisors, Mimi Hall, Interim Director of the Health Services Agency. I'm here just to speak about the importance of um, reminding the board of the gaps that we have in the behavioral health system. Um, we enjoy great partnerships with Human Services Department, with our Sheriff's Office, and with our local police departments, um, but as I, uh, as I told the board during my budget presentation, there are so many complexities to the work that we do, and uh, we have some serious gaps that are difficult to address under the funding systems and mechanisms that we have, and I really appreciate the work of not only the CAO's office, but also Sheriff Hart and Chief Wilson in working with us um, back from, it seems like the week that I got here in April on, on this focused deterrence initiative, and just wanted to express my gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, Thank your, work. for your work. Welcome back, Commissioner Minot. Good morning, Super, um, Supervisor Friend. My name is Kate Minot. I live in Aptos. I'm the second district representative on the County Parks Commission. Uh, the Parks Commission met last night in Watsonville where Supervisor Caput was. We weren't able to review today's uh, measure, uh, but we took an informal poll and we know we're gonna have a formal presentation, make a formal um, recommendation to you. As a single person, I urge you to approve this motion today. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you for, for your coming. work on the uh, Parks Commission. Do I use the phone? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Charlie? I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, I'm a lot less worried about this tax measure than the last one. Um, you know, this is more in the classic sense of uh, put a tax and provide services. Uh, it's not trying to, you know, the other one uh, I don't think is going to work. Um, parks and libraries, I think that's the fun part of local government. Those are the, the good services we get. Um, I was in the first class of docents at Quail Hollow Park almost 30 years ago. I did that for a couple of summers. Um, so I, I do support parks. But what I want to point out is that the, the elephant in the room, as far as the county is concerned, is the unfunded liabilities for CalPERS. Uh, the city of Santa Cruz just passed a half cent sales tax, and about a week after that passed, Marcus Pimentel, the finance director of the city, made an $8 million prepayment towards the unfunded liability of the city of Santa Cruz. And he described it, I think he described it as, this isn't really $8 million, this is $15 million because we would have been paying interest on this money for so many years in the future if we did not make this prepayment. Um, so every jurisdiction that has an unfunded liability with CalPERS is paying 7%. You're paying about 7% interest on that unfunded liability. And the unfunded liability for this county is about $500 million. So that's really the elephant in the room here. That's, and I, I want to point out that for the city of Santa Cruz, that's their first priority. As soon as they get more sales tax revenue, that's what they're going to do with it. That's what they did with it. Same thing for the city of Scotts Valley. The city manager at the city of Scotts Valley has looked at their finances. And, and by the way, every local jurisdiction, if you look at their CalPERS reports for all of their pension plans and you look at the projections for the next six or seven years, everybody's payment's going to double. Everybody's payment's going to double to CalPERS. The city, you know, all of our water districts, it's, we're all in the same boat. But it impresses me that the city of Santa Cruz finance director and the city of Scotts Valley city manager recognize this problem and they put that as their first priority. And their city of Scotts Valley is also planning to extend their sales tax. So I just want to remind you about this elephant in the room. Um, and another observation I want to make about this you know, gosh, I think it was more than 15 years ago I was here, and Bob Sir of Scotts Valley was in the back of the room. He was about 90 years old, I think. And he was, at the time, the county was paying about 9% towards CalPERS, and I think it's over 20% today. And, and he was like a voice in the wilderness, you know, warning, warning the Board of Supervisors then that this CalPERS problem is, is going to eat us up. And, um, you know, so if the county's paying 20% towards CalPERS every year. That means that 20% of the money that ought to be fixing our roads Thank you. is getting spent on, it just isn't going where it needs to. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address this on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll close public testimony and bring it back to the board. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks for everyone who waited to uh, speak to this item. You, you know, uh, our county administrative officer pointed out during budget hearings that the county of Santa Cruz isn't like every other county. There's lots of ways in which we could define that. Uh, but w one of the things that the County of Santa Cruz is required to do is act like a, a municipality. Uh, because so many people live in the unincorporated area, uh, we provide so many services of a city, even though we don't have the same funding structure as a city. Um, I was grateful s several years ago when Assemblymember Mark Stone uh, worked to pass legislation to allow uh, counties to have some of the same tools that cities have uh, uh, to raise funds to help pay for those municipal services. We also heard during budget hearings uh, uh, a great presentation uh, from Sheriff Hart about work that could be done to address a pressing community problem around um, those uh, uh, suffering with a mental health disorder uh, and substance use disorder and a new way in which uh, we might be able to attack the, the problem um, and really improve not only the lives of the people in, the pro in, in that program, but the quality of life in Santa Cruz County. 
Likewise, we have seen an incredible uh, amount of community support for our parks. When, uh, our, uh, when we had a, a small funding measure on the ballot, it received over 76% of the vote. Um, uh, Mariah Roberts, uh, who was here today, has helped lead uh, a fundraising campaign in which nearly $2 million has been raised uh, to support uh, a value that we all care, which is inclusivity and in ensuring that we have the first uh, all-inclusive park in Santa Cruz County. Um, uh, they, they have done that by building a broad array of uh, supporters, uh, from little kids selling cookies on, on the street corner, uh, to service clubs, to foundation. Um, this park, however, will be available to all children uh, in Santa Cruz County and it will be a well-loved uh, park. And so it seems appropriate to ask the entire county to help uh, be part of that fundraising effort in order to um, uh, to help make that a reality. We want to do the, uh, we want to start construction uh, by next summer. We also have other critical parks in our system. Uh, lastly, we know that uh, th th as we uh, heard in our last uh, measure, uh, having resources to be able to, to address um, uh, the issues facing people experiencing homelessness in Santa Cruz County is uh, is critical, um, it's important for our community, and we have to do everything we can, given that there are, are close to 3,000 people who are uh, without shelter this evening. So uh, I'm an enthusiastic supporter and will work hard uh, to uh, pass this measure, and I would, approve, uh, I would uh, make the motion uh, for all the recommended actions uh, to put this sales tax measure on the ballot. Uh, so. I'll second that. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Caput. Is there, are there additional comments? Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, much of the same. I, I just think this, I see this measure as a, a sign of strong fiscal management in the county over the last decade or so. We, we hit a big recession. We had to cut back on sheriff's deputies. We had to in, uh, put the parks department within the, the public works department, has been mentioned. Um, but now uh, we're on we're on good standing, and uh, th there's no question, as was mentioned, the pension issue obligation is over is, is looming over us like every other governing agency in the state of California. But I think we're really doing the right thing in focusing on this uh, public uh, health uh, sheriff's cooperation issue as well as parks uh, under the circumstances. As Sheriff Hart said, um, having deputies respond to 10 calls with people that are in a, in a personal crisis of one type or another um, is not something that we, looked, we, we uh, realized uh, 10 years ago. Uh, there's new challenges and it's gonna take a cooperative effort and I think we're, this is the right way to address that. And as well with our parks, um, we, have, we have a tremendous director in Jeff Gaffney who's done more with, with what he has than uh, most people could imagine and this whole parks department. But now uh, providing this, this asset, and I really see, see parks as a tremendous county asset uh, so people can enjoy their leisure time and uh, Leo's Haven is just a, a star in the sky. It's, uh, it's a tremendous um, asset for uh, the county of Santa Cruz. So I think we're filling a void when we had to make cutbacks uh, during the Great Recession and there's a tremendous need and a different need in that sheriff um, or public safety health services agency and there's always been a need for more parks in our, our growing uh, county uh, population. So I, I think we are focusing on the right things to do with this uh, proposed sales tax, and I'll support this measure. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, um, I just want to echo some of the, the, the comments, which is that I really appreciate the leadership of this board and the pre and board's previous and county staff uh, from top to bottom that have really made sure our fiscal house is in order, that we have high bond ratings so we're able to refinance and save taxpayers millions of dollars so that we're doing more with fewer employees uh, than we had almost a decade ago. Uh, and by getting our house in order, I think we've been able to you know, provide solid services to our residents in addition to starting to do some preventative programs, starting to do some innovative programs. What I see this uh, measure doing in 
almost every aspect is spending more on deterrence. By having a focused deterrence initiative, and I appreciate the sheriff's leadership on this, that's gonna save not only citizens' uh, time and discomfort and insurance charges, but then the revolving doors of the jails and the revolving doors of uh, the emergency rooms by focusing on a few people who cause a disproportionate impact to our community. By having a navigation center that, that gets people stabilized sooner and gets them attached to resources sooner, it also reduces impacts on the community and costs. And finally, by having parks that are accessible across this county to all children um, is, the, is a really the most preventative, because you're talking about a generational investment where you're giving people uh, and families and kids somewhere positive to go and to build relationships and health and uh, quality of life. And so uh, I'm excited about this possibility and I'm excited about uh, bringing forward an initiative that really benefits not only the community now, but could benefit the community for generations to come. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, to clarify something, to make it clear to the public too, uh, the when we're talking about uh, voting on this uh, tax for the parks, uh, the sales tax in the four cities will not go up. That is correct. Okay. Then one legal question, it would be uh, about half or more of the voters on this, uh, they won't be taxed, but it, it is... Uh, a uh, legal question, uh, they can vote on a tax for somebody else to pay. Uh, the entire county will vote on the tax because they will be benefiting from it, but it won't be, um, in, the tax will not be in place within the city uh, limits of the four jurisdictions in the county. Okay, is that, would that be the legal opinion also? City residents will pay the tax when they're shopping in the unincorporated area. The tax will not be imposed within city limits. Okay, so Watsonville's uh, sales tax will stay at 9.25. That is correct. Thank you. Okay, well we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. I'd like to thank all of you who came out for this item. I'd like to ask the board, we have a couple more regular agenda items I believe will be pretty quick. And are we comfortable with just going through them? Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to item six, which is a public hearing to consider resolution appointing the county road commissioner as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO and the director of public works. We have a resolution on the road commissioner appointment. We know that this is just a standard uh, process, but we have to have a public hearing on it. I don't believe there needs to be any presentation unless were there are any questions from board members on this. Uh, seeing none, I'll now open up the public hearing. Are there any questions or comments from the community on item six? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing, bring back for action. I would move approval of the recommended second. action. Second. We have a motion from Leopold, a second from Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item seven. Also a public hearing to consider the proposed issuance of bonds by the California Statewide Communities Development Authority for the benefit of Monta Vista Christian School and the amount not to exceed $6 million and take related actions as recommended by the CAO. We do have a brief presentation on this. Very brief, very brief. Uh, good morning, members of the board. Um, Christina Mallory, the county budget manager. Um, so briefly, on June 26, your board set a TEFRA hearing, which is a Tax, Equity, and Financial Responsibility Act hearing for today to authorize the proposed issuance of the bonds in an amount not to exceed $6 million by the California Statewide Community D Communities Development Authority, CSCDA, for the benefit of the Monta Vista Christian School. Proceeds of the bonds will be used for the construction of a new 60,600 square foot multi-purpose building. Pursuant to the IRS code, an elected body within the territorial limits of the project must hold the hearing to allow for public comment on a proposed issuance of bonds. The county has no liability for the repayment of the bonds. The proper 14-day notice for the hearing has been provided as required. Their representatives here from the financing team are available to answer any questions you may have. Um, Jen Pincower from CSCDA and Mitchell Solerno, I hope I didn't butcher that, um, the headmaster from Monte Vista Christian School. So it's recommended your board open the public hearing, hear any public comment, close the hearing, and adopt the resolution. 
Thank you, are there any questions from board members? And I appreciate that you were here today. I know that it's been quite a long wait. Um, seeing none, we'll now open up the public hearing. Are there any uh, comments or questions from the community on this item, item seven, regarding this public hearing for the Monta Vista Christian School bonds? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Again, thank you all for waiting back there. Number eight is to consider a final reappointment of various at-large representatives to the Workforce Development Board for terms that expired June 30th of 2022. We had nominations accepted at our, our late June meeting and we have previous agenda materials. Are there any questions or comments from board members before we open it up to the community on this? We'll open it up to the community. Any questions or comments on the at-large representatives of the Workforce Development Board? I move approval of the recommended actions. A motion from Leopold and a second from Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We're now on item nine is to consider an ordinance amending Santa Cruz County Code Section 2.14050 relating to the authority to approve contract change orders and direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance on the next available agenda for final adoption as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO and Director of Public Works. We have the ordinance, the strike out an underline and the clean copy. Mr. Machado, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Friend, members of the board. Uh, the item before you is an amendment to ordinance 2.14.050, contract change orders. Uh, section, this section of the county code provides authority to the Director of Public Works to approve and execute contract change orders. This update to the county code is to make it consistent with the California Public Contract Code. The Public Contract Code sections also provide specific limits for which a public works director may approve contract change orders, change orders, above the limits require uh, approval by the Board of Supervisors. Those limits are listed in the board letter. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. The recommended action is to approve in concept this ordinance amendment of uh, the county code, uh, authority to approve contract change orders, and to direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance amendment on the next available agenda for final adoption. Thank you, I have no questions. Any questions from board members? Anybody in the community like to address us on item nine? Regarding this, okay, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see this uh, moving forward. I move approval of the recommended actions. We have a motion from Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. It's always good to see Mr. Wiesner in a suit and tie to know what it took, and now we know it brings item nine forward. So, all those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. As a reminder, uh, item 12 was withdrawn by the appellants. That was the item on the public hearing for petition for rescission, so we don't have item 12. Regarding closed session, is there anything reportable planned? There is. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on the items in closed session before we convene into closed session? Okay, seeing none, the board will recess into closed session or adjourn into closed session, and if there's something reportable, as we believe there will be, we'll report it at the end of closed session. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for Community TV for being here today and reporting on it.